Hello, I'm Luke Boozer. Welcome to Fight Class. Today, we're going to get real. You're going to learn real self-defense, the kind of self-defense you need to save your life in the street. You're going to learn boxing techniques, but we're going to break all the rules of boxing. You'll learn kickboxing, but we'll break all their rules too. And you'll learn ground fighting, grappling and jiu-jitsu techniques, but we're going to break all of their rules. Because there are no rules in a street fight. There are three stages to self-defense. The first is psychological. That is learning how to avoid the conflict in the first place. I won't spend much time on that today. I just want you to know that most fights can be avoided if you develop the right psychological attitude. We want you to develop a kind of a, a healthy paranoia. You, you've got to, uh, uh, unfortunately, not trust anybody. You've got to assume there's always danger around the corner. And uh, if you do that, you'll probably be able to avoid most conflicts in the first place. Then if you cannot avoid the conflict, then you have stage two, which is the physical battle. Today, we're going to show you the techniques so that you can win the physical battle. And then finally, after you've won in the street, then you have the legal battle. Because there's a good chance that uh, you may have to defend yourself either in criminal court or in civil court. So you've got to adopt the code of conduct, which is first, never use your techniques unless it's for self-defense. Don't become the aggressor. And secondly, only use enough force to accomplish the task. If you use excessive force, then you'll have to be defending yourself before the judge. The number one rule of fight class is to keep every technique simple and effective. We're going to use all the techniques that really work and that are not real complicated. They must be able to pass a risk reward test. On one hand, we want to see use techniques that um, will really be effective. So if it has a high effectiveness, we'll like it. But if the risk in, in applying the technique is high, we don't like it. So we want a high reward or a high effectiveness of the technique, and we want a low risk. And if it passes that test, then we'll use the technique. For example, a, a spinning heel kick. The risk is, is high in that uh, you could get uh, your leg caught and taken down, and uh, the reward is not very high, and even if it lands, its uh, effect will not be that Im impressive. Whereas, um, in, uh, the jab is, has a very low risk. Uh, in it, when you throw a jab, you're not putting yourself in much risk, but the effect is very high, in that you can prevent your opponent from accomplishing what he wants, and the jab can be used to establish your distance and uh, set up all your power strikes. So we like the jab because it has a low risk and a high reward. We don't like a spinning heel kick because it has a high risk and a low reward. The number one strategy in fight class is to seek to always get behind your opponent, whether we're sti striking, standing up, or if we're grappling on the ground. Uh, throughout this tape, keep in mind that you want to try to get behind your opponent. The reason for that is that when you're behind them, you have all your weapons available to you uh, and your opponent has very little he can do. So you have a huge advantage if you can get behind your opponent. Distance. First thing we want to do when you step forward here, uh, there are different distances that we're going to be training on today, but the first distance I want you to know is the safe distance. Uh, back, up, back up a little bit over there, Marcus. Keep going backing up, keep backing up, keep going more, keep going, okay. Now right about here, I feel pretty safe. I don't think Marquez can punch me or kick me from there, and he can't, probably can't go in here and do a double leg takedown on me either. I have plenty of time to react to him. So if he approaches me and gets any closer, I have two choices. As he moves forward, I can retreat and maintain that safe distance. 
The other is he can approach me and fight has begun. As soon as he gets in that danger zone where I know he's capable of hitting me, I'm not going to wait, I'm going to attack. Because I consider he's entered my space and he's already begun to fight. The stance we're going to be using for our stand-up fighting is a basic athletic stance. You want to have your feet a shoulder width just a little bit wider apart. You want to have your feet with the weight on the toes and the heels slightly off the ground, just enough to slide a piece of paper under your heels so the weight's on the balls of your feet. You want to have your knees just slightly bent, okay, and the weight balanced in the middle. Now, with your arms, you want to have both hands in a position where you're, like, it's like you're talking on a telephone, okay? I've got a telephone over here, I've got another telephone over here. In this position here, I've got both sides of my face protected, and I've got my elbows down protecting my ribs. Now, in the position I am in right now, facing my opponent, we call this open stance, okay? If I turn completely sideways to my opponent, I would call that a closed stance. What we want to try to develop is the ability to fight from a 45 degree angle stance. I, know I want to have my feet and my shoulders 45 degrees to my opponent. In this position here, I can throw a variety of punches and kicks. The low lead is the front hand is not up, but the front hand is down. It will be covering your sternum and your elbow will be covering your ribs. You protect your face with your shoulder. So you can have two hands up or you can have your front hand low. And I'll show you different ways of defending from this position and different strikes that you can throw from this position here. Now, if, uh, if I'm standing with my left foot forward to the, my opponent, we call this left lead. If my right foot is forward, we call it right lead. I'm going to uh, teach you how to fight from both left and right lead. Uh, you're going to probably develop one side that you prefer more than the other. But if you learn to fight both right and left side, one, it's going to enable you to defend yourself better from multiple opponents. Two, it's going to enable you to confuse your opponent. He may be used to fighting nothing but left lead fighters. And when he sees a right lead or a south claw fighter, everything's coming from a different angle, so he could be confused. Another good reason is, let's say that he's injured my left leg, I want to get my left leg is safe, I pull it back and I've got it back here where it's safer. So there's a lot of good reasons to learn how to use fight from both sides. Today I'm not going to teach you only how to throw various strikes, but when to throw them. That's just as important as how. Straight punches are exactly what the word implies. They travel in a straight line. Your arm will go from a bent position at the elbow and extend and then it will bend again. It travels in a straight line. Now, if I'm throwing a straight punch with my lead hand, here I am in the left lead position. If I throw a left straight punch, we call that a jab. Now the jab, it, it's probably the easiest punch to hit someone with because number one, it travels in a straight line so it gets there quickly. Number two, your lead hand is already a little closer to the opponent than the rear hand, so he has less reaction time. And uh, it's a very, very safe punch to throw. The, um, the risk-reward system is something you should always use when you're uh, determining what strikes to use. Every technique must be put on this scale. Measure the risk to yourself when you deliver the technique and the reward, which is how effective will it be. The jab has a high uh, reward in that first it will interrupt my opponent from doing what he wants to do. Dave, come over here. No matter what Dave starts to do, if he wants to kick me and I hit him with a jab, it stops him. Okay? If he wants to punch me, I hit him with a jab, it interrupts him from what he wants to do. Okay? It also, as I'm throwing the jab, it will set me up so that I have the right distance to come around and use my other techniques. So it's probably, it should be the most frequently used technique. But when you're throwing the jab, come forward over here, Rob. You want a weight transfer. If I wasn't jabbing Rob but I was going to shove him, I would step forward and push like this. You notice my arm extends and I have a weight transfer. Now if I try to shove him just with my arm, it's not that effective. But if I have a weight transfer, I can shove him back. The jab is basically a shove 
but it's with one hand and the fist is closed. You step forward, you only want to have a weight transfer, otherwise the power will not be very much. The purpose of a jab is not to knock someone out, but it's to set up the power of all the other techniques and keep your opponent off guard. The cross is the same punch as the jab, except if I'm in left lead position, the cross will be thrown with the rear hand. And it's thrown the same way as the jab in that the, the arm will extend and then flex back again. But the, the power comes from the rear side of your body turning towards your opponent. First of all, you're going to start the punch by pushing with your toes. And then your hip turns and your shoulder turns and your arm extends. So this whole side of your body will come from the back to the front. This turning of the body makes the punch across a very powerful punch. And because it's straight, like the jab, it gets there quickly and it's hard to defend. Now, both the jab and the, and the cross, imagine that you have a rubber band connected from your thumbs to your uh, cheekbone. Every time you throw a punch, then the rubber band snaps it right back where it was, whether it's a jab or a cross. That way you get right back into a defensive cover position here. Hook punches. The difference between a hook and a, 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 a straight punch is that the elbow never straightens out. As you're throwing a hook punch, your elbow begin, remains frozen in a 90 degree angle. Joe Frazier, a great heavyweight champion, described it this way. He pretended that he didn't have an elbow joint at all. His arm was an L-shaped bone. Now, if you can keep your arm frozen as though it's one L-shaped bone, then you can throw these hook punches and the power comes from your legs. The uppercut hook is a hook punch where the, the hook is traveling in an upward direction. I want to hit my opponent, come over here for a second, Marcus. I want to catch my opponent right under the chin, okay? And the punch should not travel very far. Notice it travels in a little semi-circle, but I don't want to drop it down and make it a long punch because he has too much time to react. So I'm going to just, from this position here, it's going to travel maybe just a foot. Boom. The power, if you notice my leg, the power comes from the hip. Okay? So this is kind of like a big spike, and this is a big hammer. And I can drive the spike in by using my legs as the hammer. Horizontal. The horizontal hook, did come over here. The horizontal hook is exactly the same as the uppercut hook, except it travels in a horizontal fashion. The elbow, the elbow stays bent through the whole technique. And notice the pivoting of the hip again and the twisting of the front foot. If you keep your legs frozen to the ground, you're using just your arms. And you're not going to even have half the power. So you've got to let your legs turn and your hips turn, and that will give the power in the hook punches. Okay. Hitting someone with the elbow is one of the most effective things you can do. And, it's, and the risk reward is very good because when you throw punches, there's a good chance you can break your hand if you don't hit them in the right spot. Uh, so elbows are very low risk to you. You're not going to hurt yourself doing it. And the reward is high because pretty much any time I hit someone with an elbow, I, I, I'm going to cut them on the head. There'll be a gash. And there's a good chance they'll be unconscious. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do with the elbow is throw it exactly the same way I threw the hook punches. Except instead of having a 45 degree angle, I mean a 90 degree angle in my elbow for a hook punch, for the elbow I'm going to have a 45 degree angle. Because my fist is pulled into my body, when I throw this, the elbow strikes the opponent rather than the fist. Okay, for demonstration we'll have Rob. Okay, I'm in a right lead position now. From this position here, uh, if I hit him with a hook, I've got 90 degrees. If I pull my arm in, then my elbow hits him right across the temple. So this is the lead elbow, the elbow, the arm that's closest to the opponent. Okay? And then the rear elbow comes from the back, just like a cross. Okay? Now, examine the position I'm in as I throw these elbows here. One with a lead elbow, my right arm, my guard hand, remains talking on the phone, okay? The lead elbow, the striking elbow here, all I'm really doing is I put my hand underneath my chin and come across with the elbow. 
I just don't, I'm not going to bend at the waist. Don't make the mistake of throwing elbows and trying to bend at the waist because then you'll be eating knees later. So what you want to do is remain upright as you do it and your elbow comes up and down in that position here. You can throw them from any angle. You can throw them up, you can throw them horizontal, you can throw them over. I recommend you develop uh, the elbow coming in slightly over and down. It's more likely to get through their defense. <clears throat> but as I throw it, watch the, the guarded position. See my shoulder here. My shoulder is protecting my ear and jaw. My hand is protecting me from an uppercut. I've still got my guard up on this side. So the only thing he can do in countering me is break his hand on the top of my head. Now the rear elbow, same thing. It comes up, over, and down, hitting him across the temple, head, face. And I've got my shoulder protecting my jaw. I've got my hand protecting my throat. And I always want to keep my chin tucked so I can't get hit in the throat. No matter if I'm throwing punches or elbows, keep your chin down. Now, I kind of look like a little turtle peeking out of the shell. Okay, come over here, Marquez. Now, if Marquez and I were fighting, and I wanted to turn my back and hit him with a spinning elbow or a spinning hammer, there's a rule I have to have in place before I'll even think about throwing it. The 180 degrees. If my feet are lined up 45 degrees to him and he's right in front of me, I'm not going to throw it. But if he starts trying to sneak behind me and comes back keep moves in this direction here, now I've got him, my feet are lined up. This, if I turn in this direction, this is 180 degrees. I never want to spend more than 180 degrees in order to hit my opponent because it I'll be off balance and it's too much time for him to react. So as soon as he starts coming behind me, first thing I'm going to do is lift up my rear leg and hit him in the head like that. Now without an opponent, let me demonstrate. The rear leg comes off the ground, you spin on your front leg. Try to do it, learn to do it so that you can maintain your balance afterwards. The spinning elbow is really good uh, if they can start getting a little bit behind you. I don't recommend you turn your back to your opponents unless you're doing a spinning elbow or a spinning hammer. It's worth investing the time to develop the skill to do it. Now the spinning hammer is exactly the same thing. Dave, come over here. Now Dave has a little longer reach and he's fighting from a little farther distance. So when he starts getting behind me, my spinning elbow doesn't reach him. So with Dave, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit him with the side of my fist and wrist. I want to catch him right across the jaw and ear area. With, but I don't want to have my arm completely extended because if I hit him like that and he blocks it at my elbow, it could break my elbow. So I'm going to make sure my arm is frozen with a slight bend in it, okay? So from this position, he starts getting behind me. Boom, hit him like that. Now without an opponent, it will look like this. So if he's far away, you want your arm more extended. If he's closer, you bend it less. If he's even closer, you bend it more and you end up hitting with your elbow. All right. Uh, I'm classifying a knee strike in the family of kicks because you're using your legs to, to strike your opponent. But what we want to do number one on a knee strike is only throw it with your rear leg. If you try to throw knee strikes with your front leg, you find that you, you just don't have uh, enough power. So one thing that must happen with a knee strike, <coughs> you want to have your toes pointed down and you want to push your hips forward as you throw it. Now the targets on this, Rob, one target will be his thigh and hip area. Okay? Another target is the rib. Another target, I grab his head and pull it down into the face. And now if I want to hit him in the uh, middle of his body or his groin area, I'm going to have to use the other leg. 
Remember, I don't want to throw the knee with the front leg, so what I want to do is switch my feet. I'm going to step back with this leg, step forward with this leg, and then throw it. Okay? It's a switch step, and I'll teach you that more later. But here, here, here. Pretty much any place you hit someone with a knee strike, it's going to be effective. The push kick is the same as a knee strike in the beginning, in that your foot comes up in this position here, but don't point your toes down on this one. You want your toes curled up. Once you get in that position, then you're going to push your foot traveling horizontally. As though, come forward, dude. I don't want the kick sliding up his body. Sliding up like that. I want the foot push, push kick traveling in a horizontal plane. So, Rather than a, say a snap kick, it's push kick because as though as I'm pushing in the door, a doorway, and it's a thrust kick, and then I'm thrusting my weight forward as I do it. Okay. All the kicks we're going to throw are going to be thrown into the lower body. Uh, if you want to work on high kicks, that'll be up to your discretion. I recommend you keep all your kicks low because of the risk reward question. Side kick stomp. The side kick is the same as a uh, the same beginning as the knee strike and uh, the push kick. The first thing that will happen is your foot will come up in this position here. But this you haven't struck him yet, and you're not going to push forward. Now, you're going to be pushing sideways instead. So if my opponent was, come forward here. If my opponent was right here, I lift my foot up, and then instead of going straight, my, bottom, my back foot has to pivot so that I can hit him with my foot sideways. I want my heel to hit him rather than my toes. So my, my foot has to be number one, turned sideways, and my heel has to be ahead of my foot. Okay? The side kick should be used when a person's coming forward towards me. Come, come forward to me. As he's approaching me, I use this to stop him. Okay? Now, I don't want to ever use side kicks as my offense to go after someone throwing side kicks. Because, come forward here, Dave. Now, what, if, if I know that he's going to throw side kicks as, a, as part of his offense, go ahead, then it's easy for me to get behind him. So, my advice is don't use side kicks as your offense. Use it only for defensive purposes to stop your opponent from coming, coming into you. The tie kick is almost, it's almost unfair for me to teach a tie kick to you because it gives you such an advantage over your opponent. Um, if Rob was here, and Rob saw me holding a baseball bat, he probably wouldn't want to fight me because he knows, knows the damage I can do with a baseball bat. But what Rob may not realize is, I don't have a baseball bat. But by having tie kicks, it's basically the same thing as having a baseball bat with a right leg and another baseball bat here. Because I can generate enough force to do about as much damage as hitting with a bat. But the tie kick, the tie kick, Unlike a karate round kick, you strike your opponent with your shin rather than your foot or ankle. So it requires that you get a little bit closer to your opponent to throw it. it would, it's what I would call a mid-range um, strike. You should throw tie kicks only if your opponent is punching you or if you are punching your opponent. Okay? Marquez, come here. Now, if, if Marquez is too far away from me, and I try to throw a tie kick, I end up hitting him with my foot and I'll sprain my ankle. In order for me to hit him with my shin bone, I have to be close enough to be punching him. Then I can hit him with the shin bone, okay? Same thing is true. If he is starting to punch me, then he's close enough for me to hit him with a tie kick. The added advantage of me throwing the tie kick while he's punching is because if he's punching, he must have his weight on his front leg. And if it weights on the front leg, he's going to absorb the force of the tie kick at his maximum. Okay? Now, the tie kick, a couple of key uh, elements. 
One, you hit with your shin bone. Two, I want the tie kick to travel in a horizontal plane or even coming slightly down into the opponent. Don't try to throw cat tie kicks upward because Rob, come here. Get in a kind of a low stance there. Okay? If I hit him with a, in the leg with a tie kick and it's swinging upward, it kind of brushes up his leg. Okay? And kind of bounces off. So I want the tie kick to come in perpendicular to his leg. So I would come here and down like that. That way he's going to feel the maximum force of the tie kick. Um, and number three, at impact, watch my balanced foot. My heel should be pointed right at my opponent, right at my whatever I'm hitting. So you cannot let your foot stay in this position to just throw tiny kicks. You've got to let your foot spin on the ball of your foot. Now notice that unlike a karate round kick, I did not snap it and bring it back. I want to have the momentum to give me maximum power. If I was going to chop down a tree with a hatchet, <clears throat> I wouldn't hit the tree and start withdrawing it as soon as I hit it. I try to penetrate and go through the tree. That's what we're doing. We got Dave here. He's a big, giant tree. I want to chop him down with my tie kick because I'm not going to go up and I'm not going to snap it back. I'm going to pretend it's an axe. That's going to come here and try to continue. But he won't continue because he's going to absorb the force of my blow. Now, if he steps back as I throw it and I miss him, come forward, step back and I'll miss you. See how my foot continued around and I'm still in a balanced uh, defensive position. The tie kick should travel 360 degrees. My rear foot is right here. Notice where it is when I finish. Okay? Um, so, you want to throw it flat or slightly down. You want to fall through, you want to hit with your shin, and you want to have the hip. It's kind of like that song, everybody was coming from fighting, the kick, kick is from the hip. Well, in the tie kick, you've got to make your hip go from here to right here. At impact, your hip has to be close to your opponent. So that requires you to spin on your front foot. Okay. All right. If you practice karate or kung fu or anything of those martial arts, the way that they block is kind of in kung fu you have long circular movements and in karate you have this type of movement. The problem with that type of blocking is that it's, it, it, it requires too much timing. So we're going to simplify it and we're going to rather than block, we're going to primarily just cover. You have certain vulnerable areas that we want to protect. We don't want to get hit in the throat. So we're going to keep our chin down. We don't want to get hit in the jaw, so we're going to keep our shoulders up. We don't want to get in the hit in the ears, so we're going to keep our hands up. We don't want to get hit in the ribs, so we'll keep our elbows down. Now, the strong part of our body is between our fist and our elbow. This is, I can absorb some punishment and get this a little bruised and scraped without it being like a fatal injury to me. But if I get hit in one of these vulnerable areas, then it can be serious. So I'm going to use my forearms and I'm going to use my lower legs as a protective shield and I'm going to hide behind it. So from this left lean position here, I'm going to cover myself as well as I can and now if a blow is coming from an angle from this direction like this, I'm going to do a full cover outside. I'm going to make my knee and my elbow connect to each other. And then there will be a barrier from my fist all the way down to my foot. So if I uh, come over here, Marques. If Marques was to throw a, let's do it from this side here. If Marques was going to throw a right leg tie kick to me, uh, I would, he is coming around in this direction here. So now if he throws it low, I've got it covered. If he throws it midline, I've got it covered. If he throws it high, I still have it covered. Okay? All with this one move that's the same. Protecting me, my whole side of the body, high, middle, and low, by connecting the knee and the elbow. Now, the same thing is true if the blow is coming straight towards me. I'm going to connect my knee and my elbow, but it's lined up 
to cover where the blow is coming from. This is what we call full cover outside, full cover center line, and then you've got full cover inside on the rear elbow. That's protecting me from a blow coming in this direction here. Okay? Now, I can also go full cover inside to the front elbow. There's an advantage to either way. If I'm using the rear elbow, it keeps me in position so I can more effectively use my jam. If I'm using the full cover inside front elbow, it turns my shoulders and sets me up for a spin move. <clears throat> so, from the right leg, you got full cover outside, full cover center line, full cover inside rear elbow, full cover inside front elbow. Okay, remember I told you we're not going to do these karate kung fu type blocks, we're going to cover, but we're going to block to the extent that we're going to make slight movements. We're going to move as little as possible in order to accomplish the task. So if Dave comes over here, okay, if Dave, if Dave was going to hit me with a jab, let's stand right and move more over there, Dave, kind of me. If Dave was going to throw a jab at me, at my face, and one thing I can do is I can use my rear hand and move it in front of my face and stop it, stop the punch from coming, just simply by moving my rear hand over here. That's what I'll do first. Do it again. Now another way of blocking that jab is like a baseball catch. Two hands come together just like you're catching a ball. Okay. Notice that I'm not moving like this. I'm not moving like this out to meet it. I'm letting the blow come to me. I'm using the least amount of movement in order to prevent him from hitting me. Okay? That way I'm not going to be subject to his feints and fakes and combinations. I can still, even if I miss the block, I'm still close enough to, to recover. Okay, now if he wants to throw a right cross at me, let's say he's going to throw a right cross at my body, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just twist my upper body ever so slightly because he's trying to hit me right in my rib. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover it with my forearm, but I'm not going to use my arm. My hands aren't really moving. It's just the upper body twists very slightly. If he throws the same thing in my face, Okay, so it doesn't matter if he's throwing high or low. If I'm hiding behind my forearm, in just a slight movement, and I'll defend myself from that. If he's going to throw that overhand punch at me, uh, I'm going to basically comb my hair. I'm going to take this and comb my hair back like this. Slightly duck, so they can't... All right. Uh, now the uppercut. Again, if he's going to come up and try to catch me into the chin, I'm going to use just enough movement to prevent him from hitting me. So if there's an uppercut, this one more of an angle here. Okay. Now if he's if he's uh, faking and I'm moving too much, I move like this and I'm open for something else. So if you move very little. You're not going to get faked out. If you do, you're still close enough to you're protected. Okay, footwork is very important, and, it, and I suggest you spend a lot of time practicing it. It'll take a while, but once it sinks in, it'll become second nature to you. Now, from a left lead position, shuffle up footwork just simply means as you step forward, your rear leg will drag behind. This is the way that I can close in on someone. Now, if I get from right lead, it's the same thing. Now you don't you don't want to ever step forward and have your foot stay back. Now you got a wide stance. Okay? So everywhere your foot goes, the other one has to drag so you maintain this position. Remember you want to have your feet just slightly wider than your shoulders. Come around footwork is that means when the rear leg comes forward. So I'm going to step forward. Now I'm in a right lead. I step forward, now I'm in a left lead. Remember we're going to practice both right and left lead. We want you to learn to be proficient fighting from either side. 
So come around forward, is stepping forward, and this will really confuse your opponent. 45 degrees. If an opponent is approaching me and I want to retreat, the last thing I want to do is move straight back because he can easily pursue me and overwhelm me. So as I'm moving backwards, what I want to do is I'm going to step back with my front leg and I'm going to step over to the side. And then if he keeps coming, I'll step back with my front leg and I'll step over to the side again. So that, let's say Rob, if you're right here, or if Rob approaches me slowly, go ahead and step back. Now I'm over here. Go ahead and keep coming. Now over here. He's very confused. He's getting ready to throw a, a technique, and all of a sudden, I'm 45 degree angle from him. Switch step is very important, not only in knowing how to move forward and backward, but also uh, so that you can throw power with your rear leg. But for now, what I'm going to do is switch step is you step forward and you step back. You're not really moving as much as you are just adjusting your stance. So we step back and we step forward. You notice I'm going to right lead, I'm going to go left lead. Okay. Okay, on drills and combinations, I recommend you spend a lot of time doing these drills and combinations because it'll ingrain all these moves so that they just become second nature for you. Uh, the elbow drill is a way of developing these elbow strikes and the footwork. Remember, to throw an elbow, you have to be very, very close to your opponent. The big mistake in elbow strikes is that people try to throw them from too far away. So the elbow drill is from a left knee, I'm going to throw a front elbow, and then I'm going to throw a rear elbow. Then I'm going to throw a front elbow, then I'm going to throw a spinning elbow. Then I would do a come around elbow, which means I step forward with my rear leg. Remember when you come forward with your rear leg, you call it come around and throw an elbow. Now I'm going to step back with my front leg and throw a front elbow. You'll end up in a right lead now. So I'll do the same thing again. Lead elbow, rear elbow. Lead elbow, spinning elbow. Come around elbow, step back elbow. because you've got to learn how to get close enough. And the big mistake throwing elbows is that people are too far away when they throw it. So here's an exercise so for you to develop the right distance. Dave comes forward to me. I hit him with an elbow. Notice I didn't really use any footwork at all. I just held my ground. Do it again. Notice I didn't bend at the waist. If I throw an elbow and bend at the waist, that means number one, I'm reaching too much. And number two, he's going to counter me with a knee under my chin. Okay? Now, another thing is, he's coming towards me. Now, instead of holding my ground, I step back. And now, I'm switched into a right lead. Remember, I was left lead. I step back, I'm in a right lead, and the front elbow hits him. Okay? Now, I'm going to pursue him. So he's here, and as he's backing up, remember the shuffle up footwork that I showed you? Step and drag, step and drag, step and drag. Okay? Now, I'm going to shuffle up, but then, because I'm not quite close enough, I'm going to come around at the end. So, I shuffle up, come around. Let's do that one again. Shuffle up. All right. Those are really good exercises for you to learn to get the right distance for your elbow strikes. Okay. Jab. Switch step, jab. Jab, switch step, jab. Notice that as I throw the jab, I step back and I step forward. Remember where I did the switch step real earlier? I just step back and forward. He doesn't know if I'm left lead or if I'm right lead. Now what we're doing is every time we do the switch step, we use a jab. Okay, the switch step drill. What I'm going to do first, this is a really good exercise for developing the switch step and some strikes to go with it. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lift my leg up, throw a push kick, and then a jab. And then I'm going to do a switch step and throw a knee. And then I'm going to do a switch step and throw a tie kick. Now I'm going to right lead. 
same thing from the right knee. Push kick, jab, switch to knee, jab, switch to tight kick. Now, see, I'm back in the left leg. <clears throat> One of the reasons I like this exercise is that you develop the footwork, but you're also developing the jab. Pretty much you want to use the jab often. You use the jab to stop your opponent from doing what he wants to do. You can do your jab to set up what you want to do. So jabs are going to be used the beginning, the middle, and the end of all techniques. Now the cover, cover strike drill, you can do whatever strikes you want after you cover, but I want you to get used to this covering and then striking afterwards. Cover, elbows, cover, elbows, cover, knee, cover, push kick, cover, uppercut, cover, overhand, cover, uppercut, cover, cover on the elbow, cover, cover center line, cover outside, cover, spin, cover, spin, cover, tight kick. All right, let's try it with a uh, focus in here. First, we're going to do cover jam, cover jam, cover cross. Okay, now we're going to do a cover jam cross, a little closer together. Now we're going to do a cover knee. Cover. Okay, now we're going to cover elbow. That pad there. Cover elbow. Now we're going to do a cover. Tight kick. Yeah. Cover. Tight kick. Cover. Tight kick. All right, now I'll do cover. Uppercut. Cover. 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 Now do cover uh, overhand. Cover. You get an idea. Be creative, but you want to get the idea of always covering and then coming back with a follow-up stroke. Okay, we want to, uh, remember I told you the jab is the most uh, common and uh, best technique to set up everything? Well, we're going to start right now with this exercise, jab, and then use the rear arm and rear leg to come around with our power. So it's going to be jab, power strike. One thing we're going to do is we'll go jab, cross, We'll jump, jab, elbow, we'll go jab, knee, we'll go jab, push kick, we'll go jab, tight kick, okay? Okay, we're going to go jab, cross, jab, cross again, now we're going to jab, elbow, now we're going to do uh, jab, knee, we'll change it for the knee strike, do it again, Jab, uh, push kick. All right, now we'll do jab, tie kick. All right. So your jab will set up the power. Okay. Uh, the step-in drill will help you develop uh, the ability to close the distance to get the right distance to throw a kick. Okay, Dave will come over here. Now he puts it down. What I'm going to do first is throw a front leg push kick. Now notice my balance foot here, the right leg. It's not going to move at all because right now I know I'm the right distance. I just lift my foot up, throw the push kick. Notice after I throw the kick, I want to bring it back to this position here. This position is what we call chambering the kick. This way, if I throw kicks and chamber it, I can go forward or I can go backwards. So it's important not to throw every kick to chamber it. But now watch, I know that I'm the right distance, but if he moves back just a little bit, now I'm too far. Rather than reaching, I'm going to do a step in. The rear leg steps just enough so now I'm the right distance. Now, if I'm back here and he's a little farther away, it requires a little larger step. All right. Now do the same thing on a side kick. Let's go on this side here. Come close. 
the first kick, there will be no adjustment, no stepping. I'm just going to lift up my leg, throw that. Remember the side kick is used for defense. Now he's a little farther away, so I'm going to step a little farther away and take a bigger step. All right. Now I'll do the same thing for a tie kick. Let's come over here. First one, turn sideways. First one, notice I only throw tie kicks if, if I can punch him. Okay? If I can't punch him, I don't want to throw a tie kick because I'm going to hit him with my toe, spraining my ankle. So if I'm close enough to punch him, I'm totally close enough to tie kick him. Okay? Now what I want to do is he's a little farther away. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going from right leg and I'm going to throw with my front leg. So I'm going to step. Notice how the heel turned to the back. Now I have to move a little farther away. I have to take a little bit bigger step. All right. So the tie kick, whether you're, whether you're, uh, if you're really close to it and you want to throw it with the front leg, you got to do the switch step. Step back, step forward. And if he's farther away, I go step in. All right. Ideally on a tie kick, let me show you where he has a nerve right on the side of his leg here. Here's his knee. I'd like to hit him about three to six inches above his knee, right where the seam of his pants runs down. Okay? That's a primary target. Same thing is true on the inside of his thigh. A couple inches above the knee, there's a nerve there. And then another target will be just below the knee a couple inches, right here in the back of the calf. Now, if I hit him, remember the baseball bat. Here I have a baseball head. If I hit him with a baseball bat in the leg, you know he'd be hurting. That's what will happen if I hit him with a tie kick here. I step over here, hit him with a tie kick to the back of the calf, or I hit him the inner thigh with a tie kick. Caution on the inner thigh, though. If I hit him the inner thigh, I only want to throw that if I've already determined he doesn't know how to cover. Because if he does an inside cover, I hit my shin on his shin, we'll probably both get hurt. So if I know he doesn't know how to cover, that's when I will throw the inner thigh kick. Okay, so that the step-in kicks, the step-ins allow you to get the right distance. Don't throw tie kicks from too far away. Fifteens, this is an exercise that I've developed that allows you to practice all of the strikes I've shown you and at the same time advance towards your opponent, uh, gradually working your way in. From a left leg position, I pick up my leg through a push kick. Then I come around with a tie kick. But instead of continuing 360 degrees, I want to stop my tie kick right here because he avoided it and he wants to come in. So I threw a side kick to stop it. Then I come around with a spinning hammer. Now I'm back at my left lead and I've been boxed. Jab, cross, hook. Overhand, uppercut. Elbow, elbow, spinning elbow. Stomp on his foot. Knee strike. And then I move into a clinch. Okay, now. Whenever you're doing any of these exercises, these drills, or this 15, um, you should first do it very slowly and try to do it perfectly. Work in front of a mirror and analyze yourself. Make sure the form is perfect. Once you've got that down, you go a little faster and a little faster. But if you start losing your balance or your form, slow back down, go slowly enough so that you don't lose balance or form. But always push yourself to go as fast as you can. Now from here, so we got push kick, tie kick, side kick, spinning hammer, jam, cross hook, over, up, elbow, elbow, spinning elbow, up, knee, and then we clinch them. Practice it from the right leg and the left leg. Alright, shadow back boxing and practicing your combos is very important, but 
I want to give you some suggestions on some combinations to practice, but don't limit yourself to these. Go ahead and invent your own combos. All right, I'm going to suggest that as you know, any combinations, you start off with a jab, and no matter what else you do afterwards, you finish with a jab. Starting with a jab is good because it sets up your power, it interrupts what your opponent wants to do, and finishing with a jab is it gets you back in the proper stance. The, uh, it's also good to practice combinations with focus mitts too. So let's try that. First of all, show your partner where you want the combination to be. So we're going to go lead uppercut. He's going to hold it right here. Rear uppercut here. Uh, lead hook here. And then rear overhand here. So we'll go slowly.
Okay, this is what we call a living woolly drill. Uh, woolly is a, a grappling dummy I'll show you later, but we turn Dave Thompson here into a living woolly. So, so we're, we're going to be able to beat on him. He's got so much protection. He'll have the focus mitts for our punches. He'll have this guard on for the knees, and we put some tie pads on his thighs so we can kick him with some tie pads, okay? All right, let's see how this works here. is an exercise where the first step is a prearranged attack and the second step is a prearranged counter. And it's, we're going to do it just, just with uh, kicks for, for now. And we're going to go pretty easy because otherwise you get hurt doing this. Okay, but Dave, first thing we're going to do is I'm going to throw a push kick to Dave's knee. Dave's going to do a, a center line cover. Okay, and that will prevent him from breaking his knee. And then I'm going to put my foot down in pose. He'll do a counter. Now, one goal in this exercise is to go for targets. Don't just kick in the old place. He wants to hit me in my outer thigh, four inches above my knee, right where this nerve is. Okay, so here's my push kick. I'm down, then he throws a counter. Okay, that's good. Now, he throws a push kick to me. I cover. Now, see I can't hit him there with his leg because it's the front leg. So I'm going to do the switch step drill. Then I hit him. Okay? Now I'm going to throw the push kick to him. I can throw it with the rear leg if I want. He covers. And he's going to have to switch step to hit me here. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, you, as you do it a few times, you know, slowly. Then you can let it just flow and take turns. I'll kick first. He counters. Okay, he kicks me. That's good. Okay, the next one. Uh, Brandon will come up here. Okay, Brandon's going to throw it. Uh, I'm going to throw a left leg side kick to Brandon. What he's going to do is he's going to step off to his right and deflect my kick. Then he's going to throw a tie kick to the back of my front leg calf. I'll do it to him first to demonstrate. Throw it, a left leg side kick to me. Yeah. I moved over and deflected it and I got behind him with my footwork. Now what I want to do is, I can hit it here or here anywhere with a tie kick, but the most effective strike right in this position will be right here. So, I hit him there. Now if I did it hard, not only will I damage his leg, but his weight will be taken out from him. He'll go down. Okay, so now he'll, I'll do that to him. He's going to step with his right leg that way. I'm going to throw a left side kick, and he throws a tie kick. Now see, he hit me up in my hamstring, it won't do any damage. He has to hit me down two inches below my knee. All right, let's try it again. I'm kicking. There, that's good. Now, he throws the sun kick to me. Left. Same thing. See how I got behind him? Now I can kick his foot like that. That's going to hurt, and it's going to take his weight out. Now we switch leads. I'm going to throw a right leg, and you're going to step that way. So 
Good. Getting your right leg through our right side kick. I come this way. Okay. All right. Let up someone else come up. Rob. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to throw a right leg tie kick. He's going to do a full cover outside. And then he's going to counter with the right knee to my body. Okay. First you do it to me though. Right tie kick. Okay. Okay. Now I'll do it to you. Okay. You do it to me. Okay. Now, uh, I'll do it to you. Okay, good. Now this time we're going to throw a tie kick and you're going to step back. I'm going to step back with my front leg, let you miss, and then I'm going to come around with a counter with that leg. Okay, so you throw, we're both left lead, throw a tie kick, I step back and avoid it. Then I come here, okay? All right, so now I'm going to throw it to you, so you step back and avoid it. And kick in. Now when you kick, use your shin and knock my foot up that way. Use your shin, okay. All right. Uh, Marquez, come on, Marcus. Okay, uh, we're going to go a, a push kick. We're going to go a push kick, and we're going to deflect it and come back with a, uh, a tie kick. Okay, so I'm going to throw a push kick to you first. I want you to deflect it and move that way. And then throw a tie kick to you. There you go. Now you throw a push kick. Now, if you're in fight class, you'll never throw high push kicks that the man can deflect. In fight class, all of our kicks are low, so he can't deflect them. Okay, but uh, for practice, he's going to throw them a little higher, like the karate student. Okay, so he throws a push kick, a left leg push kick. I come over here. There. Okay. Now I throw a left leg push, a right leg push kick. So you're going to have to step back with that leg and go over there. Do it again. Deflect it. Throw it to me, and I'll throw it with the other leg, the right leg. Yeah, no, push kick. Okay. All right, Dave's coming back now. Okay. So Dave's going to throw a knee, and uh, I'm going to do uh, an elbow destruction on his knee. As he throws knees, my whole body's open. I'm going to use my elbow to come right down onto his knee. Go ahead. Okay. Throws it with the other leg. Okay, then again. I want to hit it. Go ahead. I want to hit my bony part of my elbow just above his knee a couple of inches on that nerve. And if he throws a hard knee, okay, this elbow coming down on his knee is going to really hurt. Okay, I'll do it to you slowly. Okay, no, elbow he went right there. Here comes another one. Dave, come back with me. Okay, now that we've had this somewhat prearranged, what we're going to do is we're going to let the first person throw a push kick, and the second person throwing the counter can throw any kick they want. But you get a point if you move behind the man, and you get another point if you hit a primary target. So Dave can throw a push kick. Go ahead. I move behind him, so I get a point. I'm going to, if I hit a primary target right back here, I get another point. Okay? Right, so now it's Dave's turn. Okay, he doesn't get a point, he didn't move behind me. He does get a point for hitting a primary target. Okay, can we do it again? Go ahead. I move behind him again. Now watch this knee boom, into this side of his thigh. Okay, so I got another two points here. Now we're going to do another one, but um, the first one will be a tie kick, and then you count it wherever you want. So here comes a tie kick. Good. Okay, throw a tie kick to me. I move behind him. So I got a two point. Okay, here. Here's a tie kick for you. Good. Uh, it's a little too low. Right up here would be a little bit better. Okay. That's two steps. And uh, you can invent your own uh, first strike and counters. Experiment with a lot of different things. Semi-sparring is a uh, way that we develop someone so that they're ready for full sparring. 
And uh, the idea is we want someone to learn how to throw strikes and protect themselves from strikes without being overwhelmed in the beginning. So what we do is we restrict the uh, number of techniques that, that will be allowed and or the speed in which they can throw the techniques. So for example, let's get uh, Dave and uh, Marcus out here. Okay, if I told them, we're, okay, we're semi-sporing, the only thing you're allowed to do is throw slow jabs. First of all, if they're only throwing slow jabs, he doesn't have to be worried about, you know, Dave kicking him and kneeling him and all the different types of punches and elbows. He only needs to think about defending against the jab, so he can be more relaxed and practice defending it. It's the same. Plus, because it's slow, he can learn to defend it before he starts throwing them harder, okay? So that's what we start first, okay? Both of you can throw slow jabs. A little bit slower. So you get the gist of that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to allow Dave to throw a slow jab. Marcus can throw a slow cross. Okay, now we're going to reverse it. Dave throws a slow cross. Marcus throws a slow jab. spinning hammer. Come over here a little far, right there. Okay. Rob's going to throw uh, uppercuts, right or left hand uppercuts, that's all, okay? You're going to catch him and you're going to throw a jab or a cross, slow. Now, now you're going to go, now you're going 
go hard, you can use a jam and he can use uh, a tie kick. Pull your tie kick a little bit on his leg. Okay. Okay. <coughs> And then gradually, when you have free sparring, we let them throw hard and we let them throw everything. But you've got to let people graduate into it. You don't just throw someone in uh, and say, okay, now you know the basic strikes, you're going to start sparring full speed, full power, anything. Otherwise, uh, uh, the learning problem, they won't learn and people just get injured. In grappling, first you've got to learn some basic grips. The palm to palm grip is essential. And it, it begins by placing your two palms together and then you have a choice of how to close your fingers over it to, to tighten up the grip. This one is called palm to palm grip, no thumbs. What we do is we close our fingers around our hand to secure it. And then the second way of doing it is put your palms together. Notice that the fingers are not parallel to each other but perpendicular to each other. Okay. We close it, and now what we're going to do with this one is wrap our thumbs, wrap around one thumb. So this is palm to palm grip with thumbs. And then your third choice would be to take your thumb and wrap it around three of your fingers. Whichever way you do this, they are all good palm to palm grips, and it's just a matter of your own preference. I like to use the palm to palm grip with no thumbs because it's more difficult for your opponent to peel your finger or do a thumb crunch. And we'll get into that later. But whichever choice uh, you make here, you've got to practice your, your palm to palm grip all the time. Just keep going like this over and over when you're sitting around watching TV or until you get so that you, instead of grabbing, naturally grabbing the back of your hand, you learn to grab the palm to palm together for your grip. Okay, the second uh, grip that's uh, essential is the wrist grip. And uh, basically all you're really doing is you grab a hold of your own wrist. Now notice that when I do that, I don't wrap my thumb around here. I don't want my thumb there, I want my thumb here. So we call this the wrist grip where you're just grabbing your own wrist. Tapping is a way that uh, when someone puts a lock on me, and they've done it correctly and I see that they're going to, about to break my arm, I can let them know to release the, the, uh, the lock. Uh, I want to tap on my body, tap on their body, whichever. Their body would be my first choice because they can feel it and hear it. And if for some reason my hands are like pinned underneath me and I can't get in the position to tap, then I will yell tap. As soon as I uh, tap, it's important that my practice partner release their grip immediately and uh, you should never use any um, jerky movements when you're putting on a lock. It has to be a slow, steady pressure, otherwise you can injure the person before they even have a chance to tap. Okay, uh, let's have uh, Rob come out here. Okay, a bar means that your arm or your leg is straight. Okay, your arm is designed to, to bend so much and to straighten so much. And if I try to straighten the arm any farther than this, say 180 degrees, the elbow will break. Okay, and that's the purpose of a arm bar or a knee bar or a thumb bar or finger bar. Any of the bar locks, we're going to break it by hyperextending the joint. The crank. Crank is. Uh, we want to have his elbow bent at 90 degrees. Okay. Now, if we hold bend his elbow here at 90 degrees, his arm, his shoulder should be allowed to have enough motion to move up to about this point, and then it doesn't want to go any farther. And then we can rotate it around, and it goes to this point, and doesn't want to go any farther. So what we want to do with a crank is we want to make it go farther than he likes, either direction. That will tear up the shoulder. It's kind of like having a, a roasted chicken. You've probably had that. You order a roasted chicken, and then you kind of pull and tear the wing apart and tear the drumstick off. That's what we're doing with some of these locks. We're kind of tearing the joints 
and tissue area apart and using anatomy to do it uh, you know, efficiently. Okay, The chokes, are, we accomplish one of two things. Either we want to cut off the blood supply by you have the carotid arteries taking blood from the heart to the brain. We either want to cut off the blood supply to the brain or we want to cut off the air supply from the lungs to the brain so that uh, our adversary will pass out. Okay, so that's the three families. You've got bars, cranks, and chokes. Uh, clinching is very important as a defensive tactic. Uh, uh, if you ever watch much boxing, you notice that sometimes a boxer who's either hurt or, or overmatched, he will tend to clinch as a defense because it's hard for the opponent to, to land a good punch if they're in a clinch. So when we're clinching, if he grabs a hold of me or I grab a hold of him, one of the key factors is you don't want to have any space between you and the adversary. For example, right now there's a space between our heads. And th this space could be used, he could headbutt me either purposely or even accidentally. And I, and I have a cut on my head. Uh, if, there, if he allows any space, I can throw strikes because of the space. So when you clinch, it's important to tie them, uh, them up in a way so that there's no space. First of all, I get my head flush against his head instead of allowing this gap. I'm going to hold my body close to his. Now it's very difficult for him to land any effective strikes to me. Okay, Dave? Okay, if Dave and I are in a clinch and uh, we're tied up in a way so that I'm preventing him from striking me. Now, I can't really land very good punches because remember when we're punching, I want to be able to use my body for power, okay? So he's got my body tied up. All I can do is hit him with arm punches, and it's not going to have much of an effect. So the best kind of strikes uh, to do when you're uh, clinched, one, is a foot stomp. Yeah. I bring my foot up right here. I look down at his foot, and I stomp my heel right onto the top of his foot. I want to uh, break his metacarpal bones in his foot. They're fragile bones, and they break easily. Knees, another strike. If I get a little bit of room, I stretch my leg back, and I can hit him with knees. Okay? Slaps. If I try to punch him in the kidneys, it won't have a lot of effect. But if I hit him with an open hand, kind of like a fly swatter, right on the kidneys, it will really sting, and you'll be surprised how fast they'll release. So when you're practicing, hit it, your partner easy, and guys will go harder until they acknowledge it. Okay? So I can do kidney slaps. I can also do ear slaps. I've got him here. I come with the palm of my hand right onto his ear. That will break his eardrum. He'll be here in dulls for a while. If his head happens to be straight on me, I can do two hands at the same time, slapping him like this. Just like that, but right on his ear. And when you do it, do it repeatedly. Slap, bing, 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 like that. Don't just do it one time. Okay, now his head's really tight, and I need to get a little space. So I'm going to wiggle. Let's go around over here. I'm going to wiggle my hand in between our faces. Then I'm going to grab the back of my hand here. Now notice, release it. Notice that I'm with my arms in form like a square box. I want to take the wrist bone where my little finger runs here. I want to put that bone right against his eye socket. So I grind it in between, grab here, and right against his eye socket, I'm going to press and grind. Now, the more he wants to pull me towards him, the more he's hurting himself. So I'm pushing and he's pulling, and he's hurting himself as he does it. The time you want to do something and the time you don't want to do something. Don't bite unless you're already locked up and you're, it's, it, the opportunity presents itself. So if he's holding me really tight like this, and I've got an opportunity, I can bite a hole right in his face, right here, take a good, you know, two ounce piece of flesh out of his cheek. And uh, that will definitely get his attention. He'll probably release his grip. Okay, so we, well, after we're framing the face, I can cause a lot of pain this way, but then I can also release my hand. Now, because he's pulling towards me, when I release my hands, his head comes forward. You see this? I release, his head comes forward. He doesn't know when I'm going to release, so all I have to do is lower my head, and when I lower my head, his head hits right, face hits right to the top of my head. So my head butt will cause a gash on his face. So you lower, you release, and you head butt. 
Now, the other thing you do when you frame the face, you come across here and you throw an elbow strike once you create a little space. It's, uh, there's a popular belief that 90% uh, of all fights will end up on the ground. Uh, I have to dispute that theory. Uh, I think that if you master the stand-up striking techniques that we've covered so far, um, you'll be able to win most fights uh, with basically just a few strikes and not, not go to the ground. So the question is, when should you go to the ground? I believe you should never go to the ground uh, unless you have to. First of all, if you go to the ground on your fight, you're going to probably get your clothes all messed up. So even though you won the fight, now you got your, your, uh, you know, all your attire is all messed up. Why, why bother with that if you can win the fight with a few strikes standing up? Secondly, if you go to the ground, you're, you may find that as you're breaking your opponent's arm or choking him, that three of his friends are all stomping on your head. So uh, it's not really advisable to go to the ground uh, because you could be going against multiple opponents. Your chances against multiple opponents are much greater if you remain on your feet. So basically you go to the ground when you have to. If your opponent is able to take you down to the ground, which he'll have to be <clears throat> very skillful in order to do that after this training, then you end up on the ground. Or if your opponent was able to knock you down on the ground, or if you just trip and fall on the ground. The, the other choice, the reason you may go on the ground is if you're doing in a stand-up fight, you find that your opponent is equally trained or even superior to you and you're losing the fight standing up, then it would be advisable for you to choose to go to the ground uh, yourself and you would take them down thinking that perhaps you have an advantage on the ground. So only go to the ground if you have to. Okay, let's just take this scenario here. Rob, let's say Rob is coming towards me and I in fact trip and fall. And as he's approaching me as I'm falling down, come towards me, I'm going to throw a kick instinctively as I'm going down. And once I'm down here, that's what I'm doing. I'm using my push kicks and my side kicks. If he does bend forward at all, I can knock him out with a kick to the head. So I can keep him away with kicks to the legs, and if he gets too close, kick him in the head and knock him out. Okay, the curly shuffle is if he tries to like circle around me, let's say he goes this way, I go like that. Okay, if he circles the other direction, I'm going to go this way. Okay? Remember the Three Stooges? <clears throat> they were the first great martial artists on TV. They had the head pounds and they had the curly shuffle, and some of their techniques we'll use. This curly shuffle is just like curly, when you just go, yup, 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 yup. Okay? Okay, get in the right lead. Okay, from this position, I'm kicking him in the leg, and now I put my foot behind his knee, my other foot in front of his ankle. I'm going to go like a scissor movement. That will collapse his knee, and bend him and take him down. Now notice that my ankle is right behind his knee still. Now all I need to do is put his foot to my sternum and, and as I move forward I'm going to cause a lot of pain on his calf and if I continue far enough it will dislocate his knee. All right let's do that one more time. Do it from the other direction. This leg comes here, here, here. If he's going to throw us, say, a soccer kick or a tie kick and I'm on the ground, I curl up into a ball like a little doodle butt, okay? That way I'm protected from the kick. When he kicks me into my arms, I'm going to trap his leg and do a takedown. So if he throws a tie kick at my head, I catch, catch it here, grab his ankle, and then from here, I'm going to roll. Let's do this again. I want you to go in that direction over there. Okay. Well, tie kick to that. Yeah, well, just either kick. a straight soccer kick or tie kick. But I'm right here, he kicks, and I cover. Okay? I catch his ankle, I push his knee, pull on the ankle, push on the knee, force him down. And then from here, I'll just continue rolling until I can get into a side mount position. If I'm down here and I want to get up, First thing I'm going to do is 
I want to make sure that he can't hit and kick me, so I'm using my legs. And I'm keeping my hand up as a guard here, okay? Then what I want to do is my left leg and my right arm are going to be my balance points. First, I'll kick him in the leg with my right leg to give him me a little bit of space. Then I pull that leg through and keep my guard up here. So we do that again. From this position here, I'm keeping him away. Put this foot down, kick him in the leg. That gives me a little bit of space. Left hand, right foot, right leg swings through, and then stand up. That's the proper and safe way to stand up. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of times where someone grabs a hold of you, and you could very easily just kick him or punch him and hurt him. But there's some times in your life where you just want to get away, or you don't want to hurt someone seriously by striking them or breaking their jaw. So, so what I'm going to go into now, you may be asking yourself, well, why didn't I just hit him? It wouldn't be easier. But I'm assuming in this situation, let's say it's your, your drunken brother-in-law or somebody, you don't really want to seriously hurt him, but you just want to escape from their the grip or uh, put him in some kind of controlling hold. Thumb escape, okay, so he grabs me by the wrist. Now, if I try to pull away from him through his fingers, you see his four fingers down here, if I try to pull that direction, I can't get my arm free. But his thumb by itself is not that strong, so if I pull right through the thumb, he can't hold me. No matter how hard he tries to hold me, I can pull right through the thumb. Okay? Now try it on the other hand. Same thing here, pull through the thumb. With assistance means that in addition to pulling through the thumb, I smack his hand at the same time. Okay. okay, now he's got both of my hands. Of course, I could pull through the thumbs, but in this case, what I want to do is I want to smash his fingers onto his thumb. So I go like that and smash his hands together. And that will cause enough pain to his hand he'll release after one or two smashes. He grabs both of my hands. Now watch what happens if I pull my arms to my back. See what happens to his head coming forward? So I pull him like this. Now he doesn't know what I'm going to do. And since I know in advance what I'm going to do, I can time my head to come down into his face as I do it. So I pull my arms back and hit him with the head button in the face. The top of my head into his facial area. Okay, this time I've got, I hold his hand just like he's my date. I grab a hold of his hand, then I put my other hand on the back of his hand, getting a good grip. Then I'm going to use one old karate horse stance to have good balance. And then I'm going to roll his wrist over the top and to the outside. Now he's going to have to either go down or have a broken wrist. You can control a strong person with this move. He must go down. Okay. Okay, now this, he's facing me and he reaches across his, on the same side, instead of reaching across to this arm, he's reaching to the same side. In that case, what I do is I grab the back of his hand and squeeze his fingers so that he cannot release his grip. What he doesn't realize is that he's gripping me and wanting to hold me and what I'm trying to do is I want to make sure he cannot release that grip. Once I hold his hand in place, then I roll my hand around like this, getting a good horse stance again, and I've got his wrist pinned to my back of my uh, hand and wrist, and then I roll him over like this, and I'm causing a lot of pain to his wrist and controlling him. Now if he reaches across to the other hand, let's do it the other direction, reaches across here, what I have to do, same thing, I trap the hand, but I turn his arm, and I want my forearm to run across his arm at a 45 degree angle. Okay? So I grab his hand, put my arm across his arm at a 45 degree angle, and then hold his hand to my chest and push down on his elbow. And that is an arm bar. His elbow uh, is being hyperextended and it forces him down. Okay. You know, if I really want to hurt him, we handshake. Just like a tug-of-war, where you pull on a tug-of-war, I pull him towards me, and he doesn't know I'm pulling him towards me, so I have the advantage of knowing what I'm going to do in advance. I lower my head as I pull him, and the top of my head goes into his facial area. Okay, 
Handshake again. This time, I don't want to hurt him that seriously, so I just want to control him. Put my hand across his throat, put my hand in his chest. Then I put his elbow right across my chest and pull on his arm and push my chest out. That's going to hyperextend his elbow and I can control him, walk him out, or I can break his elbow if I pull hard enough and push with my chest. It's important that the bony part, tip of the elbow, is pointing right at my chest as I do it. Okay. As I pull, instead of doing a headbutt, this way time I pull and duck under and put the bony tip of his elbow right on my trapezius muscle by my shoulder. I'm going to shrug my shoulders a little bit so that there's a little bit of a groove for his arm to rest in. I want his thumb pointed straight up in the air, and then what I do is I pull down on his arm, and that, if I pull hard enough, he will hyperextend his elbow and break his elbow. Okay, we handshake, and I want to just take him out of here and escort him out because he's had too much to drink. When I do the handshake, I do not want to let my hand get deep into his hand. I want to just handshake him and get a hold of his, just his fingertips. So I get his fingertips in the handshake. Then I come around, put my arm over the top, and I grab my own wrist. Remember, grab my own wrist grip I taught you in the beginning? Now from here, I turn sideways to him, and I can pull his fingers back, go in a finger bar, and if I go low enough, he's going to feel a lot of pain. So what I'll do is I'll just keep it borderline pain and say, why don't you just come this way and behave? Okay? If he tries to hit me, I'll just put a lot of pain on him. A little bit of pressure will cause a lot of pain. Party flex come along. Okay, first thing I do is I reach across. If we're sideways like this, I'd reach across with the opposite hand, and I want the edge of his hand where his little finger is, and I want to grip it. Put my thumb in the back of his, in the palm of his hand. And bend his hand, bend his hand in this position here. Then I'm going to reach under his hand, and I'm going to grab his thumb. The palm of my hand against the back of his hand, and I want to get a hold of his thumb. Once I've got that grip, I bend his elbow and tuck his elbow into my armpit. And then I just apply a little bit of pressure and he feels a lot of pain. And this way I can escort him out like he's my date. Okay, this is the same th principle, but it's a little easier to get on. If I go for his thumb and I can't quite get it, all I have to do is pinch his fingers together. Now you see how his fingers kind of look like a lobster claw. I pinch them together. Once I have that, same thing. I break down the elbow, tuck it in here. But when I squeeze, nothing works. So to make this work, you need both hands on it, and then you need to twist his hand. His hand will be twisted. Instead of pulled towards him, it's going to be twisted. So this is a party flex with a twist. Come on. Okay. Okay. Puts his hand on my chest to push me or to grab me. What I do first, I trap his hand to my chest so he can't pull it away. Okay? Then I get a hold of his fingers and I pull them apart in this manner here until I break something. But keep his hand to your chest first and then spread his fingers apart. Okay? He puts his hand on me again. First thing, I trap it so he can't get it away. Now, I don't want to grab his finger like this. I've got to turn my hand over, kind of like I'm drinking and then I reach down and grab his finger. Now get one finger at a time. If you get several fingers, they're strong, but one finger by itself can be broken very easily. Keep his hand trapped and bend his finger and break it. Okay, he puts his hand on me or pushes me. Now what I'm going to do is I grab his hand like this, right around like I'm going to tug on it again. I'm just simply going to take one step back. That allows me to slide my fingers into his palm and my thumbs on the back of his hand. Once I've got this grip, I've got to get a good grip so we can't pull it away. But in order to do it, I have to step away and get the grip on. Once I've got this on solidly, I just walk towards him and I lift his arm high. Straight arm is locked. The object is I want to straighten his arm out. Very painful on the wrist. Okay, he puts his hand on me again. And this time I'm going to reach over his hand, reaching my fingers into his palm and then turn his hand. Now I've got both thumbs on the back of his hand. I get in my horse stance again and I roll his hand out and he goes down. Okay, he 
puts his hand on me again. It's the same thing as the handshake when you pull it. You grab like this, come over here, and break his elbow over your shoulder. Okay, he puts his hand on my chest. He either grabs me or shoves me. I grab his hand like this. I come over and I put my elbow right on top. I'm sorry, put my armpit right on top of his elbow. Let's do it in this direction over here. Okay, from here, I come over here. Now notice how his thumb is pointed down. I want to keep both hands controlling his hand with his thumb pointed down. If his thumb's pointed down, his elbow point is going to be pointed up, right into my armpit. Now from here, I'm going to lift on his hand and lay on his elbow. And now that can break his arm if I do it hard and fast. Okay? Okay. Now, same thing, but instead of going over with my armpit, I'm going to go over here and put my palm on top of his bone, bony elbow. Then it's very important when I push down with his hand that I don't push down with this. I'm going to keep his hand trapped to my chest and push down on his elbow. This is a principle called opposition. His elbow's going one way, his hand's going the other. Okay? That causes him, he's either going to get a broken elbow or he's going to go down. Once he goes down, I just step over and I sit on his shoulder blade like he's a park bench. Keep his thumb pointed down, and I can just sit here and say, call 911. I'm just relaxing. Okay, we're going to do this arm bar under the armpit again. Now, I can control him or break his arm in this position, but I can also do a sit-out where, yeah, let's pretend I still have his arm. This leg just goes out, and I sit on my butt. Now, if I do that, and he doesn't know I'm doing it, imagine... I've got his arm in this position here, and I go down really fast, his elbow will break as I'm going down. So that's an arm bar under armpit with a sit out. Now when we do the arm bar force down, and I do a step over, okay, I can control him, or I can lay back, but he has to tuck his arm under, his arm will be bad, messed up in practice. So what I'm going to do is, let's come over here a little bit, I'm going to just lay back, And for this position, raise my pelvis, hold his hand to my, my chest, raise my pelvis, and that will break his elbow. Okay, from here, I'm going to go to the arm bar force down, but as a defense, he bends his arm. He bends his arm when I can't... I, now, I could try to force it straight, but one of the principles is uh, we don't want to force a move, let's go with what we've got. So if he wants his arm bent, We'll bend it, okay? He wants it bent, we bend it. Now we've got a crank and we've got a force down. Okay? So I'm gonna do a force down, arm bar force down. He bends his arm, I turn it into an arm crank force down. Okay, clinching. I have both my arms high, he has both his arms low. Okay? First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna attack his head. Okay, I've got both arms high in the clinch, you've got both arms low, okay? So from here, I'm in a clinched position, I'm going to just sit down and I'm going to pull him into the guard position. I'll tell you more about this position later, but I'm going to sit and pull him back into this position. Okay, all right, I've still got both arms high. Now I go to this palm-to-palm -palm grip, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the bone of my wrist, the side where my thumb is, right here. I'm going to put that right across the side of his neck. I'm going to go palm to palm grip, right across the neck, and I go palm to palm grip, and then that bone, I want to squeeze on his neck. Now, I can squeeze on the neck, and then what really makes it work is I'm going to step away with my legs. And that's going to mess up his neck. It'll crank his neck. So, front neck lock, step away. Okay, we're going to do the same thing, but instead of putting the bone on his neck, I put the bone right on his face. But while we practice, I just put the palm of my hand on his face so I don't mess him up in practice. I hold him here, and I step away, and that will crank his neck. Okay, I've got both arms high. Now what I do first, hold his head so he can't escape. Put my hand 
cheek, my palm right against his cheek. Now what he doesn't know is my thumb is right by his eye. So I'm going to use my thumb, just like this, and drive it right into his eye. And I'm going to hold his hand, so my hand around his head, so he can't get his head away. Okay? Same principle, but instead of using my thumb, I'm going to sneak my hand up under his face. He doesn't see it coming until it's too late. Both fingers go right into the eyes, just like the Three Stooges, but he doesn't get to go like this. And I, again, I hold his head so he can't get his hands away. Now what I'm going to do same thing. I gouge him in the eye, but I want to take it down so I allow him to move his head. He's going to move it, wants to move his head back, so I release his hand enough so his head goes back. Once his head goes back, I control his chin in the back of his head, and I'm going to push his head back and twist it at the same time. And as I push and twist, I come down to the knee and take him down like this. It's a neck twist takedown. Uh, I wouldn't practice this with each other because it's too easy to injure each other's neck as you're practicing it. Practice it in a simulated way. But you've got to first push their head back before you twist their neck. Side choke. Both arms high. Okay, come over here. Now what I'm going to do is I want to get to the side of him. I want my hand, my elbow, right underneath his chin. I want my bicep across the side of his neck, my forearm across the other side. I have a palm to palm grip and I squeeze and that will cut off the blood supply to his head, to his brain from both sides. So the first thing you gotta do is get the elbow under the chin and get sideways to him. Now that's a side choke, but even more advantage is if I can spin him and get it completely behind him. Now, I want the bend of the elbow here. Now from this position here, I can go into a lot of attacks. But if, again, remember one of the, the number one strategy? Try to always get behind your opponent. I've got a lot of advantages now. Okay, from this position, first thing I can do, take the wrist bone right across his windpipe, palm to palm grip, and I can crush the windpipe and choke him. If he happens to have his chin down and I can't get to his throat, I just put that wrist bone right across his chin and I palm to palm grip and squeeze on his chin, a chin lock. I go right underneath his nose, right under his dentures, and do that chin, that nose lock. Here, I rake my hand across his face, turning his head sideways. Once it's sideways, I clamp on the palm to palm grip. I want this bone right across his face where it's going to cause a lot of pain. Clamp it on, palm to palm grip. Now in practice, what I'm going to do is I hold him with my palm. Now, I'm going to take him down, but I'm going to release him because when I do a takedown with this technique, it's in, you can injure your partner in practice. So, in reality, I would really hold him on. But in practice, I put my hands on his chest, I lower him down like this, and I got both knees, turn around this one, both knees down like this. Now, if I had not released him, he'd still be in this position here. Okay? Now, from this position, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay him on his back, and I'm going to lay on my stomach, and that's going to break his neck. So if he was all the way down, and I was all the way down, his head would be up here. Okay, I've spun behind him. I've gotten in position for a choke. Now I'm able to get my elbow under his chin, and his chin's up. So I've got a good position for a choke. Now I can go either palm to palm grip and squeeze, or I can put my hand on my bicep and then the other hand on the back of his head, and then squeeze, and push his head forward and squeeze. Bicep grip or palm to palm grip. Rear, it's called a rear naked choke because I'm using my arms rather than, rather than using his clothes. I'll show you how to use a shirt choke later. Okay. Okay, I'm here. Instead of using my arm to choke him, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use his own clothing. So I've got his shirt, I get a good grip on it. Then I get under here in his arm and I put him in a half Nelson. Then I'm going to pull his shirt across his throat. Now, when I take him down, I'm just going to go down onto one knee. And I'm going to push on his head and pull with his shirt. And he'll be choked, his shirt going right across his throat. Just like that. 
Okay, so I spun it. By the way, when you want to spin someone and get behind them, first thing you got to do is you got to push their arm and get it in here. Once you get this arm in here, then it's easy to spin him around and get to his back. So after I've done that, I do all these locks. But now, once I've got him in position here, I want to take him down. So I'm going to sit him down. Now watch the position I have here. I will put my legs around his thighs here. I don't want to cross my ankles. Just right here, and then I can choke him. Again, I spun him. I'm attacking with his head under all these locks, and he's able to defend everything. Okay, if that's what he wants, I'll just do a rear double leg takedown. So from here, I just lower my body, put my shoulder on his tailbone. Now, I don't want to grab his knees. I want to grab his ankles. I get his ankles so that he can't step forward, and then I drive forward with my shoulder, and he'll go right onto his face. Now from here, I can step over and do that lock we did earlier from the, okay, or I can mount him. That's the rear double leg takedown. Okay, I've got both arms high. Now instead of attacking his head, I'm going to attack his arm. The first thing I want to do is grab a hold of his arm and push his elbow inward like this. Push his elbow in. Then I want to Put my hand on his shoulder, and then grab my own wrist. Now, all position, I'm going to lift. I'm going to lift with this wrist. That's forcing his elbow up. I'm going to push down with his hand, and that's going to cause his elbow to break. Okay? Now, you could be thinking, well, why, he could hit you while you're doing this. Well, he's not in a good position to really give me a good punch. Particularly, I'm going to cover myself, and I'm going to break his arm. So if he wants to try to hit me on the top of my head and let me break his arm, I'll trade. I'll make that trade. Okay. I'm doing the arm bar elbow lift on him, but before I can get it on him, he bends his arm and pulls his arm into his belly. Okay. If he does that, I just put my hand right here and turn sideways and then lift. So remember, I don't want to fight him. If he wants his arm bent, I'll go ahead and let him bend it. If he's trying to bend it, I'm not going to pull it out. That's just going to wear me out. If, if, I'm, if I can't get the lock on and he wants it bent, okay, we'll go with a bend. Now we got the side turn, elbow lift. Wizard. Okay, again, I've got this arm here. From here, I trap this arm, either straight arm, like an arm bar, or Trap it like a wizard. Either way you trap it, this will work. Then all I'm going to do is touch down like I'm playing football. And that takes him down. Okay, so from here, I've still got, I'm going for the arm bar elbow lift. Now he bends his arm again, but instead of pulling his arm to his belly, I'm not going to, if he turns his arm to his belly, I'll do the side turn elbow lift. But if he pulls his arm to his back, what I end up doing here, is I'm, he pulls onto the back, I grab his wrist, I come over his shoulder, now I grab my own wrist. Once I've got this grip on him, I want to make sure his elbows bend a lot. Now from here, I can either force him down, go on a horse stance, and force him down. Okay? Or I can sit down, I go sideways to him, my feet parallel to his. As I sit on my butt and lay backwards, his face will be driven into the cement. Now, from here, I'm going to crank his arm, but so he can't roll, I'm going to trap his leg. I trap his leg. Now, when I crank his arm, I want his arm up in the air. I don't want it close to his body. Get his arm up here, and then drive it to the back of his head. Wheel sweep. Okay, I've still got both arms high. Now what I'm going to do is I'm controlling this arm. Remember all the attacks I just did on that arm? I could do those, but in this case what I want to do is I want to take him down. So I'm going to kick my leg up there, and I'm going to swing it all the way back here. But I'm going to hit him on the, my calf on the back of his calf. That will knock his leg out from under him. Get your feet a little bit wider. Okay, so it goes here. And now I've got control of his arm still. 
So from here, I've still got control. Okay? So from here, and another good thing to do while you're doing this is put this hand on his throat. He's got his hand on his throat here. Okay. Another version of the wheel sweep is the walkthrough. Instead of doing the sweeping movement, I simply step behind him and walk. Step and walk. Because my foot's behind him, he trips over it. But let me caution you, as soon as I step behind him, he can walk and take me down. Okay? So you've got to make sure your timing is good. When as soon as you step, you walk. Now from here, all these locks I've been doing on this arm, this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and do it while I'm facing away from him. So, first of all, I turn, grab his wrist, get my wrist underneath his elbow, grab my own wrist, push and lift. Okay, and it's important that you get this all in these elbow lifts that you get your arm directly underneath the elbow bone. If it's off a little bit, it will reduce the effect from this. Touchdown. Okay, from here, I'm doing the same thing. I've got control of this arm. I could do all those locks in the arm. I could do this arm bar elbow lift because I turned around. But instead, what I'm going to do, I control this arm and keep it attached to my body. So I've got, wherever I go, he has to go because I'm holding on to him. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch down there with my hand and roll onto my hip. And as I do it, he has to go too. So it's here. Now, the farther I touch out in front of me, the farther he will be thrown out there. Okay, so it's here, here. And from this position, I've still got a control position. So I, we'll go into that later. Clinch. Okay, now we're clinching, but now I have one arm high, one arm low. Okay, from this position here, I have to push his arm up and I have to duck my head underneath it. Now, it's not always easy to do. If he's holding on really tight, I might not be able to do it. I have to wait till the right time. Maybe what, in order to do it, I do a kidney slap or two, and that loosens it up, then I pop it over. Once you get his arm up, you get your head over here, barely get your head up, get around here, get your head, get your palm, palm grip, and then make your head touch his head and hold it there. That way he can't pull his arm out again. Okay, and now I've got this, and I get this wrist bone right against the side of his neck, palm to palm grip, and I squeeze, and he'll be in pain. Okay, arm high, arm low. Duck under, just as I did. Instead of doing the choke, I trap this foot here with his leg, so that that'll prevent him from keeping his balance when it's taken down. I'm gonna grab his ankle, not his leg, but his ankle. I'm going to pull his legs out into the splits. I don't want to pull it back this way or up that way. Pull it completely sideways. Then I just force him down and I keep control of his leg. <coughs> Clinch. Both arms are low now. Okay. From here, first thing I do is I'm going to get my body away from him so that there's space here. When I create that space, I'm going to pull him into the space, and that bends him backwards, and he has to go down. If he releases, I keep my balance, and then I put my hands here, and then put my knees here. So I have a full mount position. What you don't want to do is do the bend over takedown. Let me do it without you for a second. You want to bend him over here, and then go down and land on your elbows and your head and your knees. You want to make sure that you release him, bend him over, release him, and then put your hands down, and then put your knees down. Don't go down out of control, banging your elbows and knees on the cement. Okay. From here, I come down, put my head into his face or his chest. And from there, I want to put, push pressure on his head or his chest and I'm going to pull his knees to me. Now I've got control of him. It's a double leg, but I'm still standing. 
Okay, let's see we're both in the left lead position. Okay, from here, first thing before I go for the legs, it's always a good idea to think high to make him think high. So I go here, and then I'm going to go down onto his knee with my forearm, right? Put this knee on the ground. This is preventing him from lifting this knee up and catching me in the face with it. Once I've got this in position here, I grab his ankle and I lock it on so he uh, can't move it, and then I push pressure on his knee. Now, if he doesn't go down, his knee will break. I'm hyperextending the knee. Once I'm here, I can put pressure with my elbow on this muscle in his thigh. Okay. We've got both arms low. I duck under and I get sideways to him. Or you could be behind him, but you only need to get sideways. Once you get sideways, you put, reach across and trap that far leg. Now, I'm going to pull his butt right onto my thigh. I'm going to sit and pull him on my thigh. But watch, I'm not going to fall down. I'm going to sit. Okay. Now, I suggest you practice this one without a person for a while. What you do is first, you pretend you got in position and then tuck your elbow in because if you go down with your elbow out, you'll smash it on the cement. So keep your elbow in and then imagine him right here and lower yourself so your butt goes down slowly. And then he's right here, just a little over. And then do the same thing on the other direction. Here, keep your elbow in, pull him over this thigh. I've got both arms low. Okay, now I'm going to just turn sideways to him. See how my body is sideways to his? Once I'm in this position here, I could punch him in the groin. But what I want to do is I want to hit him in the groin with my forearm. And I want the back of my hand to reach way up under his butt so I can take him down. So it's smack him in the groin and grab him behind his butt. And then I'm going to lift him up, smack him, Lift him, drop it. Okay. So he gets me in a rear choke. And once he's got it that far along, I'm probably already done. These escapes have to be done before they, uh, they get too far. So as he's starting to put this choke on, first thing I do is grab his wrist so he can't get it on completely. Once I hold his wrist and prevent the choke from going on, I want to push up on his elbow and duck my head. And then I can control him like this with a chicken wing. Grab his shirt in here. Okay. Okay. Okay, now from here, he's going to go for that choke. I stop it. I turn it around, come over here, and break the elbow. Remember the arm bar over shoulder? We did a couple. Already, we've already done it twice. I have to get his thumb pointed up his elbow right on top of my shoulder. I have to shrug my shoulder so it fits in this little gap. And then I break his elbow. Now he's gonna go for the choke with the bicep grip. So he gets all the way around, okay? Grab his bicep. Now he's got this hand up here. I've got to peel these fingers back. Peel the fingers back off of my head and break a finger and break the hold. Okay, he's got me from the behind. He got me around the waist. Okay, first thing I gotta do is get to break his grip, so I'm gonna peel my fingers. Peel his finger. Once you peel a finger off, you can break the grip. And then, right underneath the elbow, grab your wrist. Remember we did this earlier from a different position? Okay. Okay, same thing. I peel a finger. I'm going for the reverse arm bar elbow lift but he bends his elbow. Once the elbow's bent, do I try to straighten it? No, I'm not going to fight him. I'm going to go ahead and bend his elbow more. And then I can turn and do the force down or the sit down. Same thing, peel the finger, come here, trap the arm, and then step forward. Okay. First thing, peel the finger, get it free so that He's not still holding on to you. Okay. I'm going to step over here, and I want my thigh right behind, right in front of his knee. I reach under and grab his ankle, and I pull up, and that forces him down 
otherwise his knee's hyperextended. Now I can just sit here and break his knee, or I can lay back and break his knee in this position. I'll go into the uh, uh, knee bars a little bit later. Rob's going to do a double leg takedown on me, but I'm going to prevent it by taking my front leg and pulling it back so he can't get it. He wants to get a hold of both of my legs. Go ahead, as he starts to do it, I pull back, and I want to make sure that I get my hand on his shoulder blades. That will force him down, and that will give me control if I can get behind him. So we'll do it again. There you go. Okay. So you've got to pull your front leg back, pull the front leg back, get your hands on his shoulders, and then once you get your hands on his shoulders, you can pull your back leg back for balance. Okay? So. Okay, if he's coming in for a double leg takedown, I trap his arm underneath his armpits, and I grab, and look at the grip I'm using here now. I'm grabbing my fingers together like a railroad train hooking together. Just like that. Under his armpits. Now, once I've got this on, this is a reverse full Nelson. Okay, stand up. Now from here, I can just kind of balance his hand like this on me, and I'll cause pain on his neck, okay? Or I can put his head on the side. I can put my knee down, steer rest knee down, and then I can lay on his head, and then will put, if I lay out, if I lay out here, then will put pressure on his neck. That's called the stalks. <clears throat> Okay, he comes in low again. This time I just slip my hand underneath his head and get my wrist bone under against his windpipe. I get a palm to palm grip, I get his head trapped with my body, and I squeeze and arch my back. That is choking it on the windpipe. He's doing the same thing, but I can't get underneath his windpipe. His chin's down, okay? Since I can't get his, his throat, what I do is I turn my head, my hand, rake it across his face, turning his head sideways. Now I go palm to palm. This is a facelift. Now he could, as I'm lifting, roll his body around. So what I'm going to do to prevent that, put my hand on his shoulder and put my hand on his wrist. Now, as I lift, I'm going to mess up his neck. Okay. Wow. If he does a... He does a push kick on me too high. This is one of the reasons we don't throw these high kicks. He kicks me in my body, and I catch it. Even though, let's say he hits me and he hurts me a little bit, knocks me back, I catch it. Once I catch it, what I can do is I can lift it and run. Now imagine I still had it. I still have the kick. I lifted him up, and I run. He will, his head will go down to the ground pretty fast. So that's uh. Catch, push, kick, throw. Pull. Now, catch, push, kick, pull, kick me the other legs. Catch it here. Now, I could lift and run, but in this case, what I want to do is I want to uh, pull him. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold his arm with this hand. This forearm is going to come across his knee. And then watch what happens. Once I get in this position here, I'm going to imagine if I still had it step over like that. That'll throw him over there, and it's going to definitely mess up his knee. So he pushes me here, here, here. That's catch, push, kick, pull. Okay, push, kick, the left leg. I catch it. Now, I get my armpit on top of his knee, and I hold it here, and arch my back. Take down. Okay, let's say that I took him down and I've got control. Let's go ahead and do that, that uh, uh, single leg splits. I got an arm high, I got an arm low, I duck under, I trap a leg, I pull him into the splits, I take him down, and I've got control of this leg here. Standing ankle lock. First thing I want to do is step over and before he can kick me in the groin, pinch my knees together. Now I've got his toes in my armpit, I've got my wrist bone right behind his ankle. Now I go palm to palm and I'm just going to lift and arch my back. It helps even more if you turn. Now this time I lift but I didn't step over. Before I step over I just lift him up 
and I'm going to roll him over, and I step over here, and now I arch my back. Single leg, lost in crab. Okay, ankle lock on that. Okay, now I trap the leg, I have the leg, prevent him from uh, um, kicking me in the groin. Okay, now I'm going to lay back, and from here, You want this wrist bone behind the ankle, you could even do it behind the calf and do a calf lock. Instead of going for the ankle lock, you put your wrist bone underneath the heel and then you twist him in that direction there. Or if you've got the other on the other side, same thing. You hook the heel and twist it. From here, I have his leg. I step over and lay back. Now, on the knee bar, one thing that's important, I want to have, I want to have the, um, his knee pointed at my belly. Let's do this like here. His knee pointed right at my belly, the groin. Okay, I want his foot hugging it next to my face, either side. Okay, but I want to make sure it goes to my face before I go down. Once I have this on, then I go down, lock my ankles. Then all I got to do is push with my pelvis. I put the knee towards the pelvis, put the foot to the body. Hold it so he can't get, have any space. And then you just push forward with your pelvis. See my pelvis? My pelvis. That's going to cause his knee to be hyperextended. All right. Get over there. Okay. The full mount means that you've got one man on the bottom, one man on the top. And the man on his top has his legs around you like this. Your legs are inside of his legs when you're on the bottom, okay? Now this is a position that you really don't want to be in if you're on the bottom. The man on the top has a big advantage. Okay, now the first one we're going to do is, let's say that we're, I'm real close to him, he's kind of holding on me, okay? And he's, if he tries to, like, push me away, I want to get my arms way up here so that if he pushes me to either side, Trying to push me back that way. Okay. And I use my legs. My legs are pinching heels underneath his butt here so that he cannot get me away. This is maintaining my base. You gotta get really wide so he can't get you off. Great vine. Now turn more this way so they can see your feet. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide my feet in this position with his. And then my ankles, if I push, I can cause pain on him. But I can also, it helps me to maintain my balance better. So I've now got balance with my legs, and if he pushes, I've got my arms. Arms down here, so he pushes me to the side. Okay? Okay, from here, there's a, there's a place right underneath your ear and your jawbone. Feel around for it. There's a real painful spot if you press on it. There's another place right underneath your jaw here. Just dig around with your thumb until you find it, okay? These are two pressure points I'm going to look for on Dave now. So here I am, he's holding me real tight, and I find this one under his ear and dig my thumb into it. He feels it. Now I'm digging my thumb up under his jaw, okay? Now from here, put my palm right on his cheek and take my thumb and drive my thumb into his eyes. Both hands at the same time. Thumbs into the eyes. I'm going to put my hands both over his mouth and his nose so he can't breathe. That will weaken him. I'm going to hold him with a headlock so that he can't, you know, move around and accidentally butt me. And then I'm going to, as soon as I get close up, I'm going to bite a hole right in his cheek. 
I'm going to put my arm way underneath him like this, as far as I can. Then I'm going to put the other hand, the, the blade of my hand, right across this windpipe. Then I'm going to grab my wrist. What's going to happen is I'm going to close it like that onto his throat. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, okay, I've got the grapevine on him. Now what I'm going to do is grab his shirt, way behind him, pull his shirt forward, and then turn my hands, pour him in, and then stick my knuckles into it. But you've got to first grab way behind and pull the shirt forward, and then turn your knuckles into his throat. That will cut off his blood or his air or both. <coughs> okay, he's holding on to me. Now what I do is I, remember that frame face we did standing up? I get this right here, grab the back of my hand, I take this little wrist bone, and I grind, and I lean and I lay on his face. It causes a lot of pain. That'll cause him to loosen up his grip. Okay, now once I've, he's holding around me in a headlock, once I frame his face, put some, cause some pain, he releases his grip. Now I've got an arm free. I grab his wrist, now notice, his elbow's 90 degrees, my elbow goes right next to his head. We have a square form, that's very important. And then I slide underneath his arm here, and I grab my wrist. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to lift up on his elbow, like that. But I also simultaneously must slide his hand back to his foot. If you do one or the other, it won't work. If you do them simultaneously together, it will crank his shoulder. That's the shoulder crank, arm crank, up, because his hand is pointed upward. Okay, now from here, I'm going for this, and he lifts his elbow up, so I push it over a little bit, and I trap, my, trap it with my head. He gets it up, I put my head over here, and I use my head to force it over farther. That's cranking his shoulder. Now I put my thumbs into the palms of his hand, and his hand out far, and extended. Now, with my legs, I push forward, and that's going to cause his wrist to get messed up. So, on one hand, I'm using my head to crank his shoulder. On the other hand, I'm pushing on his wrist, through his wrist. Elbow up, wrist lock. Okay, so from here, from this position, I could do a finger spread. Finger spread. I could do a finger bar. I could do a thumb crunch. I could do a thumb bar. Okay, as I'm going for all this, he straightens out his arm. So I got a hold of his wrist. Now I slide my elbow, my hand directly under his elbow and grab my wrist. I push down and lift up, breaking his elbows. Straight arm, wrist lock. Arm bar, elbow lifting. Now if he bends his arm this direction, trying to prevent that elbow uh, from being uh, the arm bar. I come over here and lift him up on his side and then I crank his arm back to his head. Don't crank it when it's close to his body. His hand has to be out here. Make sure his elbow is bent when you crank. Now from this from the same position here, if I can get his arm in this position here, remember how we did this standing up? Arm bar elbow lift. And if he bends his elbow and pulls it in, now he pulls it that way, I'll go with a crank. But if he pulls it in towards his body, then I'm going to turn like this. So you've got the arm bar elbow lift or the side turn. When you do the side turn elbow lift from this position, it's a good idea to grab your shirt. Bend it, grab your shirt, it helps you keep control. Okay? Okay. Now, he wants to try to do a buck and roll. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But as soon as he gets his leg in position, pull your leg up there. I can come over here and that's what I'm going to do. He's going to try to buck me off. I'll show you that when we change positions. But as soon as he puts his leg in position to do that, what I do is I kick, pull his leg up like that. Now, some people, you just do this and they're in pain. Other people, you've got to go like that and push down on the knee. Okay, now, those were all done when I was real close. Now, I've got some space to work, okay? 
Okay, so first thing, he's trying to push me off. I'm using my legs to keep control of him. He pushes me in a direction. Use my arms, okay. Great point. Now, he, some people feel this grapevine right away, other people don't, but you can cause pain and you can also help keep your balance. Okay, if he pushes his arms up, once his arms are away from his body, he's weak. If he holds his arms real close to his body, it's hard for me to control him because he's so, it's like a, a weight. If you take a dumbbell, a heavy dumbbell, and lift it up like this, you can lift a lot. But if you try to lift it up away from you, it's a, a lot harder. So every time he puts his arm out, he's weakened himself. That's when I want to attack him. So once his arm is away, one thing I'm going to do is if he pushes on me here, I'm going to pull, push this on me, I'm going to pull it here and move up and stick my knees up under his armpits. Okay, if he pushes on me high, I'm going to swim underneath, land down in the headbutt. And then I'll brace myself and pound some elbows. Okay, pushes on me with two hands. I push them together and cross them. Move up, get my knees around his shoulders, and pinch my knees together real tight. Now, he probably won't be able to breathe very well. That might finish him alone. But then, I want one arm sideways, the other elbow across, and I can break his elbow with a, we call this a straight jacket. Okay, so one arm sideways, the other elbow's here. Now, I pull and I push with my pelvis. Okay, he pushes up, he, once he extends his arm, it's easy to control his arm. Once I get his arm over there, then I can pound him. Or I can reach under his head and grab his wrist, and I can choke him with his arm and pound him. Okay, if he's trying to hold his hands up like this, I can't really do much, but unless I straighten my arms out, straighten my arms out, I can use my whole body. And once I do that, I can trap him and get him into it. The arm bar elbow left, uh, I'm in a strip shoulder crank up. Now let's say that he's, I'm going to leverage against this cover again, but this time instead of pushing his arm to the side, I push his arm across here. I use this as a balance point like a gymnast uses a horse, a pummel horse to hop up. So hop up, up on my feet like this. Then I'm going to step around and lay back. Cross my ankles and then his elbows above my pelvis. Hold his thumb up. Raise with my pelvis, and that will break his elbow. This is a hop-up arm bar. Okay, I'm leveraging against his cover. Comes over here. Once it's in that position, I slip it into the arm bar up that we did earlier. Okay, from here, remember the cover positions we did in the kickboxing? We're like this, but then what we do is we grab our wrist so that we have a strong elbow here. And we use this elbow to grind. We do the other side of grind. Now, if he's trying to hit me or get to my head, I'm pretty well protected. But I can use this elbow to grind him real good. I just lean all my weight and the tip of my elbow right on the sternum or the ribs or the face. Okay, now we're going to reverse. We're going to still be in the full mount, but I'm taking the bottom position this time. Okay. Okay, if he got his hands on my chest, I trap his hand and pull his fingers apart, just like we did when we were standing up. All the things we did on those stand-up locks, you can do the same thing when you're on the ground. Finger spread. If, if his hands are down, I can reach his face. I want to go, my fingers in his face. I want to, to go just like an eagle claw, grab his face, squeeze, and try to rip his face apart with my fingers. Now, if I do this, he's going to try to pull his head back and get away. Reach up and grab him around the neck, go palm to palm, and pull it in tight to your body. Once you get him tight, and you know you can't get any head clanks and head butts accidentally, then you bite him wherever you can. And bite a good piece out of him if you really want to make it work. All right, from here, I duck under one arm. Now I'm sideways to him, okay? Trap this far leg, wiggle around, and get the knee right above my uh, pelvis. Okay, he's here. What I'm going to do is put under his chin, 
gouge his eyes and make his head go back. Once his head goes backwards, then I can twist and roll him off of me. But you don't try to do a neck twist until you force his head backwards. Okay, I duck under his arm and I do that choke that we did with standing up, underarm choke. Okay, now when he reaches his left hand up to grab my hand, you know, around this side here to grab my hand, I grab his hand and then I pull on his hand. Let's try it on the other direction. Duck under here. Now he reaches up, I grab the hand, and I'm going to pull on the hand, but then I'm going to push on the elbow. So I'm pulling with this hand, pushing with this hand, and that will roll him right over. Okay, all I'm doing now is trapping his wrist and my neck and taking, turning his elbow bone up and then hugging it down. That's forcing him off to the side so that I can try to get, try to get out from underneath him. I'm just throwing him off balance with that. Okay, from here I go fingers in the palm, thumb on the back, rolling with a wrist roll. Same thing we did from a stand-up position. Trap an arm so that he cannot use his arm for balance. Remember how he has to once to spread his arm? I trap his arm here. Now, I want to trap this foot. Now you notice, this whole side over here, there's nothing to support him and give him any balance. Now watch out what happens when I raise my pelvis. I can reasonably roll him over because he can't use the arm or leg on that side to catch his, his balance. Okay, let's say that I'm going for this uh, buck and roll. I trap his arm, and I want to trap his leg, but before I can get his leg trapped, he sticks his leg out. Now, now I try to buck and roll, and he's got balance. So once he does that, I, he's forcing me to go to plan B. That means I turn on my side, I push this leg up, pull this leg around here. Now, I lock my ankles. This is called a half guard. I've got one leg, both legs wrapped around one of his. I'd like to get both of my legs around his whole body, so I want to now turn on my other side and then push the other leg and get the other leg out the same way. Now it could take several minutes of struggling to make this work, and then you lock, you lock both ankles and you're in a much better position. We'll discuss this position more later. But here's an exercise to try to develop that move. It's called side slide into guard. So one, turn on your side, push his leg away, and pull your leg free. Then you get onto the other side, push his leg, pull your leg free. Practice that. Sometimes it works like ABC. Sometimes it may take quite a struggle, but that's the technique you try. To, uh, in order to get yourself in the guard rather than have him in your guard. Okay. All right. You're going to do a hop up arm bar on me. Okay, let's try it right here. Okay. Remember the hop up arm bar he did, we did earlier? He's going to do it to me now. Try up here. Hop up and do an arm bar. You see how I grabbed my palm as he started to do it, and I did a palm to palm grip. And as he laid back, it actually pulled me up and got me in this position here. Once I'm in this position, now I'm in his guard, or I can try to move over into a side mount position. Let's try that again from a different angle. See this? That's what allowed me to pull myself up. If I didn't get this hand, he could have easily laid back and broken this elbow. But because I got my palm to palm grip, I was able to pull myself up as he was going back. Okay, now, one thing he wants to do to prevent this, as I've, as I've got this on here, he's going to try to take this leg here and put it against my bicep and kick my left arm away. Let me get the palm to palm grip first. I got a palm to palm grip. He, put, he puts that leg on my bicep, pushes it, and forces it. 
Now he can get back to business. Okay. Or another way he can do it is, I'll do this with you this time. Grab the palm and palm grip. You're pulling up here. And as I'm pulling up, he's holding it. So what I do is put my wrist bone against it here. I go palm to palm. I just arch my back. And then I've got him. Okay. So I'm on top position. Okay, now I'm on top and I'm laying sideways to him. Okay, I've got both my hands on top of him. Okay, first thing I'm doing is I'm going back for those pressure points. See the spot under the ear, spot under the jaw? Okay. Thumbs in the eyes. Smother, same thing we did from the full mount. Hold him in. Bite a good piece out of it. Elbow thumb. Now, from here, I'm going to slam my elbow down into his face, or I can slam my elbow in this direction. Here or here. Trap and pound. Okay, this arm here. I want to trap this arm here, so we cannot use that. Trap this arm here, so we can't use that. Now I've got this arm and this arm both so he cannot defend himself. Now I can pummel him at will. He has no arms to defend himself. So I hit him whenever I want to. Okay. Knee strikes, stretch your leg back. Remember, every time you throw a knee, you stretch it back. Remember these elbow grinds that we did earlier? You grab your head like this, tip of the elbow right in the sternum, in the ribs, in the face. Okay, he puts me in a headlock. I frame his face, frame his face, that causes pain. I put my knee up onto his body here like this. Then I slide my hands up to his elbow, turn his elbow so the point is here. Trap his hand between my shoulder and ear. Now you see there's a space, there's a space between his arm and my body. That's where I'm going to hug the elbow, and I'll break it. So his elbow will break if I just hug it into that space. Okay, he got me a headlock. I frame his face. I mount. See how I've got stepped over? Now, instead of a side mount, I've got a full mount. Then I step over and lay back into the arm bar that we did earlier. From here, I grab his shirt as far back as I can and pull it around and then use get a good grip on it and then take my wrist bone and put it right across the windpipe and then turn my wrist in that position there. My wrist will be going right into his windpipe. No. Knuckle choke. Both hands go way behind his neck, reaching far back as I can, and then turn the knuckles in to the neck. Okay, near side arm tech. Okay, remember how this arm trapped here? I put this knee around his body, hand on his shoulder, this hand directly, wrist right underneath his elbow, grab my own wrist, push with my hand, raise my wrist, and I got arm or elbow lift. If he bends his arm, I grab my shirt up here, and I squash it real good and tight so it's really good bent elbow. Then I just step over and turn over and look over that way. Okay, from here, I got control of the arm still. I do a sit out. Now, from here, he wants to try to roll me over. So if I got my legs way out there, good, he can't roll me over because my legs are out and that's too much weight. If he tries to come up behind me, I hold this arm real secure so he can't get up behind me. Once I get a good balance point between the two, then I'm safe and go pound, pound, pound. Okay. Okay, now from here, if he lifts his head up a little bit, I come over here and grab under his armpit. Now I lay back onto his neck and that's cranking his neck. That's the stalks. Stalks in a sit-up. 
Now, from here, put his elbow over my thigh, push down here, break the elbow over the thigh. If his arm bends, I trap it here, and then I roll forward like that. That's going to crank his shoulder. Force him over here to the side. Pull over here, choke him, pound. Pull up here. Put this here. Bend this wrist down here and grab your own wrist. Now I've got a wrist lock on. So that's elbow up, wrist lock. You got him over here. You pull his arm back. First you put first you put this leg up, jerk his arm back. Now I'm gonna have his elbow bent real good right over my thigh. Once I get that secured, turn more over this way. Okay, so I'm here, I put this leg up, jerk his arm back, and bend it real good. Now I gotta get my knee on the other side of his face. Now I'm just holding it here. All I do is I turn and look over that way. Step, step. Kind of pinch the legs. Pinch the legs real good, get it real tight, and then do it. Okay, that's the arm that's farthest away now. Okay, here, straighten arm, slide under the elbow, grab your wrist, elbow up, elbow up, wrist lock. Arm crank up. If I have him in this position, and I'm doing this arm bar elbow lift here, and he bends his arm this way, I keep the grip on, and I just do it and turn it into his shoulder crank up. Push his arm over, use my head, forcing his arm over and cranking his shoulder, use my thumbs in his palms, and push forward to get a wrist lock on him. Thumbs in his palms, fingers on the back of his hand, and then that's getting your wrist lock, pushing forward with my legs. Now his hands pointed downward, okay. We want 90 degrees, grab his wrist, slide it under here, grab my wrist. Now it's not gonna crank him very well like this, so one thing I can do is I can try to crank him or I can step over, lift him up on his side and then Cranking. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a sit out, but the mistake will be sitting out and laying on his stomach. I don't want to lay on his stomach because he can sit up. So I'm going to do a sit up high on his chest and then crank it. Scoot around here, put my knees right around his head, pinch his head. Now I can crank it here, but let's say he grabs his hand palm to palm grips to defend it, and I can't really do it, okay? So what I could do, is he's on this side here, I'd use an elbow, this elbow here, and lean and jab him right in the ribs of my elbow. Do that a couple of times, it loosens his grip, then I lay down. Now I've got the shoulder crank, but I've also got a choke around his head. My leg is underneath his head, the other leg is across his face and the knee is right in front of his throat. Now, watch what happens. What ha happens to my foot? I want to get it behind my knee and then I can squeeze. Now I've got side mount top position, one arm under his head. Okay, from here, palm to palm grip, I've got to get this knee up to this shoulder, okay? In order to get this arm sideways, otherwise this arm will be in this position. I'm gonna get this arm sideways, so I pull the knee up here, here, and then I just lift his head forward. From here, put my blade, karate chop blade, right across his windpipe, Grab my wrist and do that 
scissor movement right on his throat. Okay, from here, I grab his armpit. That's going to force his head forward like that. I can put pressure on him here, or I can step around and then put pressure on, him on his neck. I just now notice the hand that's under him is not the choking hand. I lift him up and turn him right behind him. The other hand is choking him. So I can do a choke, or I can do a face lock. I can do a lot of things for that position. He pulls his knee up as a defense. If he pulls his knee up and he doesn't control my wrists, grab a hold of my wrists. Before he ever pulls his knee up, he should control at least one of my arms. If he doesn't do that, he pulls his leg up, and then I come over here and come into the heel hook. Okay, same thing. He pulls his knee up and he doesn't control my arms. I come over here and grab his toe, come under here and grab my wrist. Then I keep his knee bent. I'm going to bend his toes right towards his body. Okay, same thing. He pulls his knee up. Now I go over here. Now watch what I do with my hand. I'm going to grab my shirt, get a good grip. I'm going to squash his knee so that it's really good and bent. Okay, once I get this, I'm going to just get my knee over here, and then I just turn. What I'm going to do once I have it, I'm going to turn and look over that way, cranking his hip. Okay, he pulls it up again. Now, I'm going to lay over here. Head lock him, pull him in tight. Body could hold out. Okay, his arm's up here. I parry his arm over. Let's say I duck under. Duck under. Do a palm to palm grip. Lock him on. Now he reaches around, trying to grab my hand. I grab his wrist, pull on his wrist, force his elbow over, and roll him over. Okay. I'm going to, in order to get his head to go back, I'm going to gouge his eyes a little bit. Now, once his head goes back, once his head's back, I can twist and roll him over. Eagle claw, eagle claws. That will force him to give me a little bit of room. Okay, once this gives me a little bit of room to lift his head up there, then I can hit him with knees to the head. Okay? Okay? And then from here, Okay, I hit him in here, in the head, and then I come around here, and I roll him over. And that leg choke that I did earlier, I lay on my side, get my knee right across his throat, and put my foot behind my ankle. Okay, now, I'm going to pull my knees under his chest, but remember, I've got to have control of an arm before I attempt this. This arm's over here. What I do is I put my other knee up under his face. Turn his elbow up so it's hot, up on top and hug his elbow into the open space. Now if I happen to have this arm instead of this arm, I bring this leg over, roll him over like that, and do the arm bar. Okay, it's the same thing we did earlier where I'm gonna try to get I want to try to get my legs into this position here. So let's try it again. Turn more angle like that. Now I want this leg up so he can't hop over and do a full mount. I'm going to push on his leg and turn it down my side and try to get this leg in here. Once I've got one, then I'll do the same thing to try to get the other leg around. Okay. Now, notice how I was always trying to get in a position so that uh, if you're on the bottom, you want to get your legs around them. Now, there's a lot of things he can do to me now, but I'm going to try to escape this position here. Okay. I can punch him here, but it's going to be, be defending that pretty well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to punch him right in the groin. Okay? And I'm going to elbow him right here into the thigh. Just inside where it will be through that tight kick. Right here like this. So I'll repeatedly elbow him like this. Push him in the groin. That's going to cause him to loosen his grip on me. 
Okay. Next button now. From here, he's locked me up with his legs. In order to make him loosen up, I take the bony part of my elbow right here, and I lean on the weight and grind it. Then what I do is I flip my shin right on top right here, all my weight. Then what I'm going to do is lunge forward and headbutt. Boom! Okay, then I'm going to climb up and get into the full mount. Okay, now, instead of having my knees down, my knees are going to go up. So, okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put one leg up and I'm going to reach back and feel. I'm not going to look. I'm going to feel for his foot. Once I get my toe, my fingers right across his toes like this, I'm going to stretch his leg vertically across my thigh. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach under his ankle and grab my wrist. Now from here I can do a toe lock. Okay? But I can roll him over and step forward for balance. You gotta bring this foot forward for him to fall forward. And then do the toe lock. Okay. Okay, now I put a leg up and I put it back. And there's a little try to get a little gap in here so I can get my arm down through here. Once I get my shoulder under here, right behind my shoulder, right under his knee, I grab his shirt like this, and I drive forward with my legs, pinning his knee to his face. Then I'm going to go into a headlock. And then from here, I can either hold this position, or I can roll him into a side mount position. Okay. Now I hop up so that both knees are up. Now, my legs are outside of his. Go off your ankles. Okay, now as I go smacking the ball, pinch my knees together. Then roll him over. Okay, same thing. Hop up. Stacking means to get him stacked up so he's just like this and squashed. And then I'm going to roll him over. Okay, I hop up and I stack him here and then I pull his head forward, make it difficult for him to breathe. Okay, I hop up, lay back, and watch this. I pinch, cross my ankles, and I pinch his knees together. I'm going to hold his knees tightly together. Then I take his feet and I spread them apart. Okay, knees have to be together, spread the feet apart, just kind of like you're bench pressing. Now, he's got a leg around only, legs around one of my legs. Okay, he wants to get this leg out around this one, but he wasn't able to do it. Okay, from here, before I attempt this, it's always wise to try to distract him. So I'll try to hit him. I look I kind of like I'm going for an arm, but once I get distracted, I step over here, lay back, and then do a knee. The half guard, okay. So now the half guard, remember how we grind the thigh before we grind the thigh? Pull this leg free. I've got a mount, or pull this leg free. I've got a side mount. Hold him and bite. Push his head back, twist his neck, and roll him over. If I have his hand right here, fingers in his palm, thumbs on the back, push and roll him over. From here, if his hands are down, he's inviting me to grab his wrist, then I release my legs, then I turn onto my hip, then I reach over his shoulder and grab my wrist. And then I might make sure his elbows bend a lot. Now, I, before I crank him, I got to get out from underneath him. So I've got to wiggle, 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 wiggle. Now I'm on the opposite hip. Now, so that he can't roll out of this, I crack this leg. And then I don't want it close, I want it up here and crank it. Okay, his head's down. So I just reach around, put my wrist against his windpipe, grab my other hand. Now I'm going to squeeze on his neck, 
but I'm going to push with my legs. Squeeze on his neck, push with my legs. Okay, so from here, his hands are here. I trap an arm, a hand between my shoulder and my ear. I turn this elbow up and hug it. That forces him down on this side. Then I just swing this leg over. Let's do it on the other side. Hug it down here. Now I just swing this leg over, and then I put it underneath his head. Then I want his thumb pointed away from me. My pelvis here. Okay, push with my pelvis, armbar. That's called armbar over. Okay, he's real tight. I trap, I trap this leg here. This leg just swings over like that. Get him off balance and roll him over and you got the mount. Okay, I duck under his arm and I choke. Now he reaches up. On the other hand, I grab his hand, pull and push and roll him over. Okay, his hands are on me. I spread the fingers. Slap his ears. Eagle claws face. That forces him to give me a little space. Thumb jab, just put your hands, cheek, uh, palms on his cheek, and drag your thumbs into his eyes. Trap one hand, one hand, hand behind his head so he can't get away. I get my knees up under his chest. He's reaching out like he's going to choke me. I turn this elbow up. You know, I pull his elbow into this open space. I've got to have my knees holding him here, so otherwise if he's down here, it won't work. Turn it up and hug it. Gouge his eye, get into a little space, put one foot here, and the other foot knocks him out. Okay. All right, you're going to th uh, throw a punch at me. He rears back. Now see how I push him away and I pull him forward with my legs, controlling him. So he rears back to punch me, <sighs> pull him with my legs, and I deflect his arm. <sighs> 